right. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I just uh, was trying to make sure I got my uh, our. We have one councillor uh, unavailable to it. Uh, traveling and coming in remotely and one uh, one councillor who's uh, not able to join us tonight. So um, uh, welcome to this evening. Uh, as we call the meeting to order, I just want to acknowledge that we're gathering here on the traditional ter territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people. Specifically, we recognize the Lekwungen people known today as the Songhees and the Esquimalt Nations and that their connections to these lands and these adjoining waters continues to this day. Uh, up first, we have approval of the agenda. And just note that a few things got sh shuffled around in the last few hours, but nothing uh, substantively changed. Uh, so just if you're paying attention, just make sure you're following the digital agenda. Uh, so we can have a motion to approve the agenda. And moved and seconded, thank you. Changes, corrections, or amendments people wish to see? Not seeing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed, none opposed, it carries. We have adoption of the minutes. We can do both of the uh, April 11th minutes at the same time. Moved and seconded. Just give me another second. Thank you. Uh, any corrections or changes to the minutes? All right. Councillor Braithwaite, I'm going to expect that if you've seen issues, you have seen them ahead of time and have time to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, uh, so at this point, we're just going to move forward. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? That carries. Uh, we just have receipt of the Committee of the Whole minutes from April 17th. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, any discussion, changes, corrections? All those in favor? Any opposed? Unopposed? It carries. Uh, Mayor's remarks brief. Nice to see uh, members of the CRD who are coming here for a presentation in a few minutes. Um, I want to let the people know if you're watching the, the YouTube live stream, it's delayed by about a minute. If you do want to talk to us in our public participation period, this item's not on the agenda, but just for general interest to Oak Bay, uh, I would ask that you call in now and raise your hand, and then we will get to you. Uh, at the end, the conclusion of my remarks. Um, just a couple of updates. People have probably seen some things going on around town. So uh, the bike lanes going in at Fowl Bay and Fort, those are ours uh, to connect to Victoria's as they're doing their implementation on the uh, western side of that on Fort Street. So that'll be a nice upgrade coming. And they're already painted in place. I actually rode along them today. Um, uh, just some timelines that I think Council and the community would probably be interested in. Uh, our redrafted active transportation plan is expected back by the end of May, uh, as is the McNeil uh, uh, design coming back uh, for the active transportation update. So a heads up on those two. Um, I think the only other thing I was just going to comment on was uh, two things. Uh, one, I uh, may have seen in the news today that uh, the other Mayor Murdoch, as I like to call him, or the Murdoch who spells his name wrong, uh, and I had a little uh, community to community challenge. So we're... Uh, we're challenging our respective communities for raising funds for a uh, for a prosthetic clinic in, in Ukraine. It's based out of a nonprofit here at UVic, and uh, so my 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 request of all members of, of Oak Bay is, if you have feeling generous, that's a great place to go. Um, but I'm just appreciative of uh, really the camaraderie of all the leadership in the region to do this kind of thing for the betterment of, of our society. So that's great. And I also just wanted to share that I went to um, the Canadian College of Performing Arts, which exists here in Oak Bay, uh, put on their year-end performance of. Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat this, uh, and this wearing this week, it's amazing. It's, it's one of the most uh, high energy, enjoyable shows I've been to in a very long time. So in support of our local school and in support of our uh, students, I highly suggest people, if you have a chance to get out to it, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Those are all my comments. We move to our public comment and question period. We don't have anybody registered, I don't believe, tonight for, for speaking. So. Uh, and nobody has jumped online to signal that they wish to speak, and I recognize everybody in the hall. I don't expect them to stand up and speak, so I'll give it a second here if anybody from the public wishes to address council. Um, but Ms. Bagnell, is there anybody else that you have on your system that can be trying to raise their hand? Nope. Okay, with that, if anybody comes in late and wishes to, uh, to come in, I will certainly uh, give the opportunity, because we never want to stop people from speaking, but tonight's a quiet night. Uh, so we get right to the CRD, which is fantastic. So um, I also just want to let people know if people are calling in on any of the next sessions, uh, which is 8.1 to 8.3, these are all items that we dealt with at Committee of the Whole. They still allow for public input when they come here, but we've had a pretty fulsome discussion at the Committee of the Whole with public input there. And so I'm just going to ask if, again, at this point, if anybody wishes to address council on any of those three items, uh, this is the appropriate time to raise your hand in the app. Uh, you can call the 1855 number, hit star 9, or you can go into the Zoom app and do it that way under reactions. 
Um, but this is a good time to raise your hand because we'll get to those at the end of the CRD presentation. And I'll take all the public comment uh, for those three items to the beginning of those because we're expected to go through them pretty uh, pretty quickly as we're there just uh, we're taking our own recommendations from last week. With that, welcome members of the CRD. I think we have uh, everybody here. Um, I'm going to welcome uh, Board Chair Plant and uh, CAO Robbins to the front table. Please, uh, the floor is all yours. You have a presentation, I understand, and the uh, format here is pretty relatively informal. You'll present a uh, fairly short presentation. We have, a, a, I think, a longer presentation available to us that we have reference to, and I'll take any questions at this table, and then we'll let you go out and enjoy the sunshine. So welcome. Thank you. Oh, you have to just push the button. Thank you. It's like being on mute on a Zoom. You're not sure if you're on or not. Good evening, Your Worship, members of Council, members of your Oak Bay staff, and members of the community. Thank you for the opportunity to come tonight and present to you. My name is Colin Plant. I'm the Capital Regional District Board Chair. I'm also a... ...to have after this opportunity to speak with you. I'll be heading to my own Council meeting over at uh, Senate Chambers. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the members of the Executive Leadership team who will then make the presentation, but I'm certainly going to stay here and uh, be uh, witness to what's going on. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. It is great to have this opportunity to speak to you. To my right, your left, is our Chief Administrative Officer, Mr. Ted Robbins, and he will uh, introduce, uh, pardon me, provide the opening remarks. I just would take the opportunity, if I may, from my left and to your left to right, uh, and I recognize people on the webcast may not be able to see these members of the uh, presentation. This is Mr. Ian Jesney. He is the Acting General Manager of Integrated Water Services. This is Mr. Nelson Chan, our Chief Financial Officer. This is Larissa Hutchinson, the General Manager of Parks and Environmental Services, and Ms. Kristen Morley, who is the General Manager of Corporate Services. We are so appreciative that you've given some time for us to come and speak, and we hope this is informative for you, and just to know that we are uh, available to take questions after today if we run out of time. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mr. Robbins, and I'll go sit in the gallery so others can come through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Plant, and uh, thank you for all your service in the CRD as well. It's a uh, your four and a half the year, I think, at this point, as chair, and uh, and well deserved. Uh, we certainly appreciate your service. Welcome, Mr. Robbins and yeah. Mr. Chan. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Chair Plant, for the introduction. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and members of staff that are, are here this evening. As Colin said, my name is Ted Robbins, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at the Capital Regional District. And we really want to thank you for providing the opportunity for us to. Uh, present this uh, information to you tonight. Uh, we want to share a bit of information about the CRD and uh, provide an opportunity to answer any questions you may have about the CRD. And as, as the chair said, if not tonight, then certainly feel free to follow up uh, after uh, tonight. Uh, just next slide, please. So we've got a few slides to guide our presentation tonight. Uh, we are going to provide a quick overview on regional governments uh, and the CRD more broadly. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about C CRD service delivery and provide a financial overview of uh, the services that we provide. Uh, we were going to provide an opportunity for the general managers to, to provide a, a brief overview on some of the key projects that they are delivering through their departments. I don't think we'll have time for that, uh, even though you've been very generous with, with your time. So we'll probably cut the presentation off, but there's some information there, as the mayor noted, uh, that you could certainly follow up on. Uh, next slide, please. So what are uh, regional districts uh, anyway? Uh, maybe a next slide after this. Thank you. So regional districts are, are an order of government established by letters patent uh, in the province of BC in 1966. And as a result, we have quite a unique uh, local government structure here in British Columbia compared to the rest of Canada. Uh, anybody know how many regional districts there are in BC? 27. 27. <laughs> Very good. From the back. <laughs> 27 regional districts in BC, most of which were established uh, in 1966 or, or thereafter. So really, really regional districts arose out of a need uh, for greater regional cooperation and collaboration on service delivery, particularly around regional and sub-regional issues. Uh, and today, re regional districts really have three basic roles. Uh, we provide regional-wide services. Uh, of course, uh, that would be the case here in the Capital Regional District. We provide solid waste management, uh, parks and regional planning, just to name a few examples. Uh, we also provide intermunicipal or intergovernmental or sub-regional services that can be delivered more effectively and efficiently uh, through shared uh, partnerships uh, and shared service delivery models, whereby 
uh, the partners uh, and the residents, in effect, really only pay for the services that they receive. And that's one of the beauties of the regional district structure is you as municipal partners really decide what services you want to participate in for the, for the most part. And the third uh, primary function is to act as the local government for the uh, unincorporated areas of the regional district. And of course, in the capital region, we have three unincorporated areas, the Salt Spring Island electoral area, uh, the Southern Gulf Islands as an, an electoral area, and the Juan de Fuca electoral area uh, out west. Next slide, please. <clears throat> a lot of information on this slide, but it really is intended to give you a sense of uh, what levels of government provide what services uh, and where the jurisdictional authorities lie. And, and we can see from this slide that it's sometimes uh, understandable that the members of the public uh, find this quite confusing and it's unclear as to who does what and who's responsible for what. So with parks, for example, uh, of course, there are municipal parks that, uh, that you folks uh, oversee. There are regional parks that uh, the CRD has responsibility for. We have electoral area parks, community parks in the electoral areas, and then of course there are provincial parks. And, we accept that sometimes it's unclear kind of who's responsible for what. And likewise with utilities, water and wastewater, of course the municipalities uh, operate their own municipal water and wastewater systems. The CRD operates sub-regional uh, services, uh, particularly around wastewater treatment and, and drinking water treatment. Uh, but the province is responsible for, for groundwater and uh, water licensing. So again, a bit of a bit of a mix there in terms of who's responsible for what and likewise with health. Uh, just final example, the CRD through the Capital Regional Hospital District partners with Island Health and community stakeholders to uh, develop and improve health care facilities in the region and provide capital funding for uh, infrastructure, but the province is ultimately responsible for health care systems and uh, services. So just a few examples to give you a sense of where the, the regional districts fit within uh, service delivery across the different jurisdictions. Next slide. And next slide. Just for some context, uh, of course, the Capital Regional District covers a large area, about 237,000 hectares uh, to be exact, and the population of the en entire region currently sits at almost 440,000 people, so the region continues to grow at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, the Regional District is comprised of 13 municipalities and three electoral areas, as I mentioned, and there are 18 uh, at least 18, in fact, uh, First Nations who identify parts of the Capital Regional District as traditional territory, 11 of which have uh, reserve lands and settlements within the, the Capital Regional District. And many of those nations uh, receive uh, CRD services, either directly or indirectly through uh, the CRD or their neighboring municipalities. And uh, the CRD is composed of both rural and uh, urban subregions and communities, as, as you can tell, particularly when you see the differences between our electoral areas and the, and the more urban centers. And it's really this diversity that, that brings, uh, brings uh, makes the region a, a special place. Uh, but that, of course, comes into play with decision making, particularly around the board table, as, as you probably know. Next slide. In terms of the governance uh, and administrative structures uh, at the CRD, the governing body of the CRD is the CRD board. Of course, we have 21 uh, municipal directors. Uh, Mayor Murdoch, uh, of course, is OPE's director on the, the CRD board. And we have three directly elected uh, electoral area directors, all of whom make the 24-member uh, board. First Nations in the region uh, do not participate at the board table. Uh, only modern treaty First Nations have representation on regional district boards. Uh, such as the Swasson First Nation, Nation over in uh, Metro Vancouver. Uh, Swasson has a seat on the Metro board, but there are currently no modern treaty nations uh, in the CRD. Mm -hmm. The board chair establishes uh, standing committees uh, of the board. We have 10 standing committees this year uh, that uh, Chair Plant has established. And generally speaking, the recommendations on policies and direction to staff flow up from the standing committees uh, to the board for, for final decision. And then in addition to those 10 standing committees, there are over 70 uh, committees and commissions that have been established by the board over time. And those committees and commissions are responsible for overseeing uh, the operation and administration of many of the sub-regional and, and local services that uh, we deliver as the regional district. And I know some of you participate on those uh, uh, regional uh, subcommittees and, and commissions. I'm sure you also know that the CRD operates three corporate entities. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the CRD was incorporated in 1966 and given its service authority and mandate uh, under the letters patent. Uh, the Capital Regional Hospital District was established uh, in 1967 
by way of the Hospital District Act uh, to mandate the sharing of capital costs for regional health facilities, and the Hospital District Board was established in 1974, shortly after uh, the incorporation. And then, of course, the third entity is the Capital Region Housing Corporation, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the CRD with a mandate to develop, uh, manage, and deliver affordable housing uh, across the Capital Region. And the same administrative structure applies for all three corporate entities. Next slide. So here we have a photo of uh, the Regional District Board for the 2023 to 2026 term. Uh, Director Plant, of course, is the current chair of the board. Uh, those elections take place uh, annually. The board also represents the Housing Corporation Board and the Hospital District Board as well. And Director Murdoch, Mayor Murdoch, uh, you wear a number of hats, uh, is the chair of the Hospital District uh, Board this year. Next slide. Uh, the board has uh, set five priority areas uh, for their term uh, for the next four years with this associated outcome statements. Um, so we uh, have indicated those five priority areas on this slide, transportation, housing, climate action and environment, uh, First Nations and governance. And you may recall that there are some similar themes from the previous board, but uh, this board felt that uh, it was important to carry on uh, advancing some of these priorities. Uh, and as a result, we've had direction as staff to uh, complete uh, the corporate plan, which was approved by the board, uh, I guess, on the 12th of April, where we brought forward 134 <laughs> specific initiatives that we will deliver across the organization under five different uh, community needs categories, which all support uh, these five uh, priority areas for the board. So we're really excited to get going on that work uh, across the organization. Next slide. And those are just the community needs areas, again, which uh, uh, identify the areas where we have those 134 uh, initiatives that uh, we've now put forward uh, to support the board's priorities. So with that, uh, next slide, I'm going to ask Nelson to uh, speak to the services and financials uh, for the organization. Uh, good evening, uh, Council. I uh, want to thank, uh, you know, Mr. Robbins and uh, Chair Plant for the, uh, and yourselves as well for the warm welcome. Uh, happy to take you through a brief uh, introduction around CRD financials, uh, maybe a little bit of an orientation as well. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, first slide. So um, in terms of the CRD, as uh, Mr. Robbins had mentioned, uh, the CRD exists to provide services intermunicipally uh, between municipalities and electoral areas. Uh, we operate uh, close to just over 200 services. You can see them split uh, there between regional, uh, which has participation from all municipalities and electoral areas, uh, sub-regional, which is a subset of that, and then local, um, which is just the electoral areas, uh, which Mr. Robbins mentioned, we are the regional government uh, that administer and deliver services on behalf of the unincorporated areas. Next slide, please. Um, we do have a handout. Uh, I'm not sure if it's gotten around yet, but uh, this is uh, something we call CRD on a page. Uh, this breaks out uh, the 200-something services. I think, I think for the sake of um, you know, my aging eyes, uh, we left out the local area services, uh, since those are unincorporated only. Uh, and we do list regional and sub-regional services. Uh, what you can see is by participation of uh, the various jurisdictions, there really is a pick and choose, um, you know, participation in some of those services. Uh, a number of uh, jurisdictions look to the CRD to deliver services uh, that they feel um, is more cost effective in order to realize economies of scale, uh, versus uh, other services that they would prefer to deliver themselves. We do offer um, that opportunity to join or leave particular services. And you can see that's just a, a, a graphical representation of what that looks like. Next slide, please. Uh, one unique thing about uh, regional districts, and this uh, goes to the participation of services as well, uh, is that we are responsible in managing and maintaining budgets by service. Uh, it's really the only fair way to do it. Uh, if you participate in select services, we want to make sure that uh, only those participants contribute or pay into those services. Uh, so I do manage a lot of books, uh, about 200 of them, uh, which is a little bit different than municipalities where you have general revenue and then you can allocate and sort of move things around. Regional districts are prohibited against doing that uh, just based on the structure and legislation um, of those bodies. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give a, a sense of the uh, scale and scope, uh, Mr. Robbins mentioned uh, we are responsible for three uh, entities. As a conglomerate of those three entities, it's, uh, uh, there's an operating portion and capital portion. Uh, we just approved our 2023 budget and uh, sit in at just under, um, quick math, $600, $700 million. Uh, that number, of course, fluctuates particularly um, with capital, but uh, generally speaking, operating is pretty, 
uh, pretty stable. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of uh, our 2023 budget, which we just approved, uh, legislation requires we do that before the end of March. Uh, here's a table that shows uh, participation rates um, in terms of requisition and what that looks like uh, in terms of tax impacts uh, across the region. Uh, you can see Oak Bay is highlighted there. Um, I think staff uh, were really proud uh, to bring a budget uh, in for 2023 at under 3%. You can see that there, it's roughly 2.8 on an average cost per household, given all the economic challenges uh, of inflation and CPI and so on. And you can see that it varies uh, by participation and that's part of the uh, pick and choose uh, subcontext or, or sub-regional services that I'd mentioned earlier. And you can see where Oak Bay sits uh, on that end. Next slide, please. Uh, so I think this is actually my final slide. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, Oak Bay, uh, just to give some context or uh, appreciation of what that impact is, um, you can see that uh, we requisition uh, through Oak Bay roughly $6 million to deliver all of those services, which includes uh, the hospital district, uh, the housing corporation, um, and then contributions to all of those uh, regional and sub-regional services. When you break that down, it works out to about $887 per average household. Um, and, you know, when, when I think about my own property taxes and what that looks like, the proportion of the CRD and uh, CRHD portion compared to my total property taxes, um, it's always an eye opener. I think it's, it's probably the paradigm shift that we could help uh, educate a little bit about uh, awareness and the impact um, that the CRD has on uh, property taxes and requisition. That works out to roughly uh, $2.40 a day uh, to have regional parks, uh, emergency management, uh, stormwater, liquid waste, a whole bunch of uh, different services. So uh, just really proud of uh, sort of where, where we landed on that. Um, you know, I, when I buy a coffee in the morning, it, it costs uh, more than $2.40. So uh, just really uh, proud of that. The last thing I'll say is that Oak Bay does participate in arts uh, and culture as well. You can see that highlighted uh, there. I actually have tickets to see uh, Joseph in the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat this week. So um, thank you, Mary Murdoch, for mentioning that. Uh, really proud to be supporting uh, local artists as well. And I think that's actually my last slide. Uh, so with that, um, I, there's a handful of slides uh, in the deck just highlighting uh, each of the general managers and major projects. Uh, maybe we'll leave that uh, with uh, council to review, uh, but certainly open the floor to take any questions um, that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Robbins and Mr. Chan. That was, uh, that was great. I, uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, I appreciate your, your highlighting the arts there at the end because it also is one of the best ones to highlight the regional versus sub-regional nature where we have some things. Thing, and that's often a tension at the CRD table as to who's joining what, where, and when, and at what point things go from a sub-regional where you can opt in or out and make it a, a regional where there's a lot more consistency and uh, certainty in the funding model, uh, which is the, the plus side. So with that, I'm happy to take questions from anybody here. To Go ahead, Councillor Smart, and then Councillor Watson. Thanks, um, through you, Mayor. Um, just curious, um, as a new councillor, communication and um, um, I do sit on a couple of the commissions right now, but as far as just knowing um, all the great things that are happening at the CRD, I just wondered, reading the board meeting minutes, like I just wondering what's suggested as far as sort of really um, keeping abreast of what's going on and opportunities. Yeah, certainly, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, it, it's an area that uh, we want to continue to develop uh, because of the range of services that we offer and and uh, and probably, frankly, a lack of understanding still in terms of how decisions are made and who who is responsible for what in terms of the decision making bodies because we have so many. Uh, the communications around the work we're doing, decisions that are being made, continues to be a focus for us. In fact. Uh, we've just embarked on updating uh, a communication strategy with our internal communications team, which will focus on both improved external and uh, internal communications. And so uh, right now, of course, we're relying on uh, our corporate documents, like our corporate plan, our annual reports that we produce uh, for some of the, the services. Some of those are, are regulated and others aren't. Um, but uh, it really, it can, we can appreciate it really doesn't give uh, the taxpayer a full picture of all the services we provide and, and the context in terms of how decisions are made and where priorities are. So it's certainly an area that we're, we're focusing on, but otherwise right now we're, uh, we're reliant, uh, the public are reliant on those corporate documents that we publish. Of course, we do have social media channels as well, which are intended to direct folks to uh, 
various places, including our website, which I know can be challenging to navigate as well. It's another uh, area that we're focusing on, but uh, that's that's what we have at this point. Any and just one more follow-up question, just with regards to some of the um, um, shared topics, and I guess the two that came up in your presentation for me were climate action and emergency um, uh, management. I just wondered if you could speak at all to, um, I guess, maximizing um, and leveraging everything the CRD um, is able to support us with um, uh, in order, I guess, to not duplicate the great work that's that's going on. Um, I just wondered if you could speak a, a little bit um, to that. It was definitely something that came up uh, in the election for me as, oh, well, climate action, that's not a municipal issue. Um, so I just wonder if you had some comments about that. Yeah, so certainly through you, Mayor, and, and I might look to uh, Risa Hutchison, our, our general manager who oversees the climate action function, just to provide a response to a lot of work happening regionally and with municipal partners. So. It's a good call. Welcome, Ms. Hutchinson. Yes, thank you very much, Mayor. Yes, and it's, it's good to see you again, Councillor Smart. Um, through the Intermunicipal Task Force on Climate Action, certainly that's the best place to come together as elected officials to share what's going on. That is, uh, through the Climate Action Service, we also have a newsletter that everyone is uh, receiving through that task force. So if you're not getting that, it's important to sign up for that. And that's really where uh, elected officials can come together, share what's happening in municipalities, and also hear what's happening at the CRD level and the services that we can provide to support the municipalities. And uh, we also have the similar... Um, a committee for staff. So we have an intermunicipal st staff group that get together and they share learnings and work on uh, regional workshops and that type of thing as well. So I think on the climate action front, um, we're, we're well positioned uh, to have a couple of avenues for, for information sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just, yeah, just, just to follow up, in terms of regional emergency management, of course the CRD uh, uh, delivers through the Regional Emergency Management Partnership, regional uh, emergency management uh, work. Uh, we partner with all the municipalities. We have representation on the Regional Emergency Management uh, Partnership Steering Committee from both the local governments and, uh, and the provincial government. And so that's where a lot of that work is happening uh, at the, the regional level. And we're going to continue to develop uh, the regional concept of operations and share that information uh, through uh, your staff, uh, both administratively and, and with your emergency managers. Uh, so a lot of work happening there uh, in concert with the province. And, uh, and like I say, that information flows. And any concerns that uh, around uh, regional emergency management uh, can certainly be directed up through the, the REMP, as we call it, the, the acronym. And uh, we can take those issues up there. Thanks, Mr. Robbins. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to Mr. Robbins. Um, I have a question, and it's more about financial mechanics and the orange uh, co color-coded fee-based services. And I just wanted, um, well, maybe it'll go to uh, Mr. Um, uh, Chan. Uh, uh, if, um, first of all, do fee-based services uh, there, therefore not appear on the local property tax bill? Mr. Chan? Uh, through the Mayor, uh, that's correct. So. Uh, the the CRD does recover revenue through a multiple or multitude of different uh, revenue sources. Uh, in fact, uh, unlike many municipalities, the regional district recovers uh, less than 25% of our operating budget through requisition. Um, so the fee-based services um, is, a, is the largest chunk of our revenue source, and those would be driven really on a user pay model. So if you consider uh, solid waste as a great example, um, it's, it's funded entirely by tipping fees. So as haulers, commercial haulers, even individual haulers, uh, take content to Heartland, um, it's paid for by the weight and the amount that they actually utilize as opposed to, um, I'll call it fixed cost versus variable cost, uh, which we typically see in property taxation. So just to follow up, please. So how does, by, what's the cost recovery method for bylaw enforcement? Do you charge those who you write tickets to for the, the, the cost of the ticket? Like, how does that actually flow back so that you get revenue for that? Sure. So through the, through the mayor, uh, there are uh, services. I, it's not black and white. It's, there's a number of shades of gray. Uh, so uh, a service like bylaw enforcement uh, does have participation from different uh, jurisdictions and then has uh, different cost recoveries. So some of that is fixed and variable. So certainly we generate revenue from infractions. Uh, unfortunately, I, I would say that in, uh, that revenue is not sufficient. So there is a supplementing uh, aspect to it. I think you know another similar one would be recreation is very, very similar. Uh, there is a, 
a uh, sub uh, sub subsidy uh, that's paid for uh, or provided by municipalities to operate um, rec centers, and then we charge sort of the top up or the differential in fees and charges. Thank you. And then just one follow up. This is kind of an arcane question, but I wondered. In the CRD, are there any old improvement districts, or were they all replaced when the CRD took over the function of delivering uh, services in the electoral areas? Yeah, certainly through your mayor. Uh, there are improvement districts that still exist within the Capital Regional District, and uh, they fall under provincial jurisdiction, and the province is trying desperately to dissolve and collapse improvement districts. And so, in fact, that's how uh, the CRD uh, ultimately uh, establish or has established a number of our local services, particularly in the electoral areas. They typically, the electoral area local services typically started out as improvement districts or private utilities in the case of water and wastewater. And typically the, the developers or the improvement district boards reach a point where they don't want to volunteer anymore. Their liability issues, typically their infrastructure is in poor shape. And so the province has been quite generous in providing uh, conversion grants, uh, they call them, to have those uh, improvement districts uh, become CRD services and therefore dissolving the, uh, the uh, improvement district. But it's been challenging because typically those improvement districts have not invested in infrastructure. And so when we take over as the, uh, the owner and operator, uh, typically we're coming in with higher fees, which uh, creates some challenging conversations, as you can imagine, but that's, uh, that's the case there. Thank you very much. I think it's helpful as well to understand that the, uh, the requisitions come into the municipality and then the municipality actually allocates it according to our, um, you know, our, 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 our tax rates and so forth between different classes. So uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to our guests and, and the whole team is here, so that's good. Just wondering about any um, uh, key or emerging issues that uh, you're dealing with kind of as a, through the regional lens. Yeah, certainly through you, Mayor. You know, I think uh, our, our board, uh, with their priority setting, has hit some of the, the key, obviously, emerging issues that the, the, uh, they and we as an organization expect uh, will challenge this region moving forward, particularly around transportation. And there's certainly a desire with uh, the new board to look at uh, a governance model there for regional transportation. That was certainly one of the top priorities. Uh, housing continues to be a top priority for the region. I uh, know all the municipal partners are, are feeling that as well, and, and certainly our board. Uh, wants to focus on providing more affordable housing and supportive housing uh, for uh, this region for this this term. And we also know there's a role there for the municipalities as well. And then, of course, First Nations reconciliation, uh, a key priority for the board. Uh, we have a number of initiatives that we've identified within our corporate plan that uh, we hope to deliver. And in fact, we're, we're just embarking on a, a study with uh, the province in partnership with a few other regional districts around the province. Uh, to look at uh, the governance model and uh, the impacts of the Local Government Act on First Nations participation, uh, whether that be for treaty nations or not. So a number of things happening on a governance level with, with First Nations as well. So that would be uh, a few points, but uh, certainly our board has identified between those five priorities a, a, number, of, a number of areas that uh, the board feels and we feel will challenge the region and hopefully we can make some progress uh, over the next four years. Thank you very much. Uh, yep, follow. I'm going to have to wrap this up pretty quickly here, so but go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Just to follow up, of course, one question that um, residents ask frequently, and there may be a few that are tuned in and are watching, but certainly with climate change um, and the, um, the certainty of the water supply for the region. Yeah, certainly. Of course, uh, I spent the last 10 years before moving into this role as the general manager of Integrated Water Services, so that's uh, an issue that's near and dear to my heart for sure. So. Uh, one of the uh, major achievements last year was to complete the 30-year uh, uh, long-term water supply plan for the uh, Regional Water Supply Service, and that was approved by the Regional Water Supply Commission and the board uh, last fall. So that was uh, an important document for us, really sets out the, the future for uh, the regional water supply, nails down some timelines that we will need to bring in additional uh, source water, uh, which will, of course, start with going into the North Basin of Souk Lake uh, Reservoir and then eventually bringing on the leach water supply to support uh, the growing region and and uh, and manage and, and mitigate the impacts related to climate change. So we're really proud of the document. We're glad to have that uh, that that roadmap, if you will, for the next 30 years. It also sets out the, uh, the infrastructure and financial plan associated with uh, all those investments that will likely take place over the next 30 years. So that really maps that out and, and, um, and 
So we're, we're in good shape, uh, even though there was, a, I think, an article about uh, potential drought this year. Uh, we're not concerned about that yet. The, the reservoir is uh, full, and uh, we should be in good shape for this summer. So nothing to worry about there. Thank you, Mr. Appleton. Let's go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Well, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for coming. Um, this is going to be a difficult question to answer in 30 seconds. The mayor will probably try to crack down on timing, but uh, I'm just casting my mind. We're here at the eastern end of the CRD, and I'm just casting my mind to the western end of the CRD, and I'm just kind of wondering at sort of the 40,000-foot view, what's the context of the conversation as far as, you know, the Juan de Fuca area, the western end of the CRD, and, and just the, the pressures for uh, housing containing the urban uh, boundary and those types of conversations that I know are pretty live in that neck of the woods and obviously that's married with the concept of co of uh, transportation but um, what uh, is the CRD engaged in, in doing just sort of at a high level strategic plan for for that area immediately adjacent to the incorporated part of, of the CRD mm -hmm. certainly through you, Mayor. yeah certainly lots of pressure as you can imagine with uh, the growth in the region and the cost of living particularly in in certain parts of the region a lot of pressure to look at development uh, beyond the the urban or even semi-rural areas uh, to try and find lower cost land and lower cost housing but of course we're having to continue to rely on the uh, the regional growth strategy which of course was approved by the board uh, and maintain those servicing policies that are embedded within the regional growth strategy to to control development control pressure obviously we don't control what happens within the, the municipal boundaries uh, on the west shore and beyond but uh, but certainly we rely on the, on the regional growth strategy and no doubt over time there, there will be pressure to revisit those those servicing policies and of course a lot of that uh, drives back to uh, the need to look at servicing capacity whether it's uh, water or, or wastewater servicing capacity uh, for those for those areas but that's certainly something our board will be uh, monitoring closely as uh, that pressure continues to build thank you anything else thanks uh, I don't, Councilor Braithwaite does not have her hand up and we're getting long on time, so I'm just going to uh, turn back to you and just thank you very much for your time and let you get out of here. Uh, oh, Mr. Chan. Uh, maybe I'll just close and say uh, thanks, Council. Really appreciate uh, coming tonight. Um, uh, because information technology also falls within my portfolio, uh, I would not recommend uh, reviewing the minutes from every board meeting. Uh, we do have uh, on all of our social media channels and also on our website uh, a sign-up for notifications. Uh, we do publish a monthly uh, board uh, highlights documents um, and through the notification you can be alerted every time that comes out which is a little bit more consumable and proactive uh, from that part uh, but just thanks for that thanks for that uh, mr. Chen anything else before we let you go thank you so thank much. You very much for your time no no that's great thanks thank you all for coming it's nice to, to see everybody here and I think it always takes some getting your head around exactly how this works so having sort of a, a 101 for all of council at the same time is really really appreciated so thank you for that great. all right As they depart, I will move to the uh, section eight. And again, as I mentioned, uh, these are reports and memorandums from the Committee of the Whole. And uh, I don't see anybody's hand who has popped up. Ms. Bagnell, I don't, and nothing on your line for you that have indicated they wish to speak. So we'll do them independently, but, um, and obviously we can have as much debate as Council sees fit, but just uh, for the public's uh, Benefit, you may wonder why are we going through these very fairly quickly. It's because we did spend uh, the significant amount of time on this at the Committee of the Whole and that body, which is us, and sitting as a non-legislative body, we recommend to ourselves uh, some of these recommendations, but they don't get acted on until us as legislative body mm -hmm. receives them and, it's interesting, and uh, moves them forward. So with that 8.1 debt management policy, we have the recommendations from the April 17th Committee of the Whole meeting. We don't need to read it in, but I think we just have a mover and a seconder to um, uh, the, of, the, of the recommendation that we have here. Move the recommendations, Your Worship. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Is there any discussion on this? Don't see any, so we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, we have uh, 8.2 car share facilitation options. Again, the recommendations from April 17th. Same mover and seconder. Uh, move the recommendations under section 8.2, Your Worship. Thank you. Move and seconded. Again, any discussion? Looking forward to seeing those come back. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed, and then 8.3. I move the recommend staff recommendations under section 8.3. Thank you, and seconder. Move and seconded, thank you. And um, I think we'll end up having to play with this one a little bit as we go forward, just because I think it'll be the first time walking through this, but uh, appreciate the pieces here. All those in favor? 
Any opposed? Then opposed. That carries. We move to section nine, uh, also subject to public input. Um, but the st public have a bit more time to jump in here on this one. So we're here to speak to the Oak Bay Speed Reduction Strategy, phase one. Uh, we do have Mr. Rennick, our Deputy Director of Engineering and Public Works, here with us. Welcome. Um, if any members of the public do wish to address Council on this item, I would encourage you to call the 1855 number at this time and hit star nine, at the star nine, not pound nine, uh, to raise your hand within the app or come into the Zoom app using the meeting ID and password that's on the agenda and uh, you can raise your hand within the app as well. Um, process here, we'll have a presentation uh, from Mr. Rennick, we will have questions from members of Council, uh, and then we will have an opportunity for public input, and then we will get to any recommendations from this body. So welcome, Mr. Rennick. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I thought I would move up to the podium instead of yelling from the back of the room. I'm here to speak tonight on phase one of the Oak Bay Speed Reduction Strategy. In 2016, the district carried out a speed study, and that study recommended following the Transportation Association of Canada warrant procedure for setting and evaluating speed limits. So that procedure consists of monitoring driver speeds, either through radar or uh, tube counters, and ensuring that at least 85% of drivers are traveling within 10 kilometers per hour of the posted speed limit. If the 85th percentile is more than 10 kilometers per hour above the speed limit, it tells us that we need to make modifications to the road to slow people down. The 2016 study found that on most roads in Oak Bay, the 85th percentile speeds were between 40 and 50 kilometers per hour. And so of the various recommendations of that report, the one that it endorsed was setting a blanket speed zone of 40 kilometers per hour for all of Oak Bay with the exception of some major routes such as Fowl Bay Road, Cadbro Bay Road, and Cedar Hill Cross Road. Oak Bay staff have been working to implement this 40 kilometer per hour zone, but in British Columbia, municipal governments can only change speed limits by amending bylaws and signing individual streets. Now, this council has directed participation in regional pilot projects to look at other ways of setting default speeds, has also endorsed Township of Esquimalt's letter, which you received from Mayor Desjardins. Um, however, while we are waiting for a response on those, some of our other regional partners, for example, City of Victoria and District of Saanich, are taking their own approach by signing individual streets. So staff is recommending a phased approach to establish a 40 kilometer per hour speed zone. Rather than signing every single street in Oak Bay, of which there are approximately 110 kilometers, what is being recommended right now is that roads that are designated in the official community plan as collectors, which is our second busiest class of road behind those arterials, any collectors that are not already signed at 40K or slower are being recommended to be lowered to 40 kilometers per hour. This will result in lower speed limits on approximately 10 kilometers of road in Oak Bay. This is being brought forward as an agile, relatively low cost way to set expectations for drivers on some of our busiest roads by putting signs up to tell anyone who's not already traveling 40 kilometers per hour that this is the expectation for vehicle speeds in the district. There is a draft bylaw prepared to implement this strategy if that is what council so directs and I'm happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rennick. I'm just gonna check in here. We've done mostly uh, procedural pieces uh, today, but I wanna make sure Councilor Braithwaite, uh, you are uh, with us and we're not having any technical issues with you or unmuting and I can see you there, so that's perfect. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so with that, uh, we have, thank you for the presentation. We had the report, we have the draft bylaw, so we'll get to questions. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Smart. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, I wondered if um, you could outline how many of these proposed um, roads uh, to receive the speed limit reduction would be roads that may also be considered for um, active transportation and uh, cycling routes over the next couple of years. Uh, Mr. Rennick. Through you, Mayor, uh, there's not surprisingly a bit of overlap between those roads that were designated as collectors and those roads that were identified in the active transportation plan. 
Uh, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but for example, Monterey Avenue is one of the roads that we're proposing to lower the speed limit on. Monterey was also identified in the active transportation strategy. Uh, so there will be some overlap between those two um, classes of road. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Um, and I guess just then my next follow-up question, you might not be able to answer that at this point, is um, with the potential um, um, cycling routes that may receive upgrades in the next few years, would, would that possibly change the speed limit on these particular roads to be different than, than 40? Um, Mr. Rennick? Uh, through you, Mayor, not necessarily. It, each one would need to have a detailed engineering study done because there's a number of factors that we would have to consider, not just speed limit, but road width, sight lines, is there parking, is there not parking? Each one would kind of need its own tailor-made approach. Thank you. Is there other questions of Mr. Rennick? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Yes, thank you, through you, Mayor, to Mr. Rennick. I have to confess that I am confused about what we have, what we're allowed to do, and what we're proposing to do. So my first question is, um, uh, just back to the proposals that have sort of been launched out of a squimalt, what, what is that ask of the province which would allow us to do something differently than what we're doing right now? So that's my first question. Mr. Rennick, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, thank you. Through you, Mayor. The British Columbia Motor Vehicle Act says that within an urban area of the province, any road that does not have a speed limit is 50 kilometers per hour, unless it's a lane, then it's 20. The Motor Vehicle Act further says that a local government may, by bylaw, vary a speed limit. Mm -hmm. Now, there is some discussion among the engineering community and also the police community in British Columbia as to whether could you say by bylaw every road in Oak Bay is 40 kilometers per hour and not put up speed signs. Now that's an approach that's used in city of Nelson for example when you enter Nelson there are signs on all the roads that say unless otherwise signed roads in Nelson are 40 kilometers per hour. The feedback that we've heard from Oak Bay police and from other regional forces is that they are concerned about not just enforcement but also how, how do drivers know that and how do you reasonably make that expectation? And so the approach that's been taken in the capital region is, at least right now, if you would like to see a lower speed limit, you pass a bylaw, you put up speed limit signs. What Township of Esquimalt was looking for was the ability that a municipality could direct their own default speed. So, uh, sorry, just to clarify, so replace the 50K with their own limit or their laneway speed of 20K with their own limit for their lanes. Okay, thank you. Um, um, I might just, just jump in and just a little context here as well is probably a little bit helpful in case you're, uh, this, this has been looked at multiple times. It's come to a UBCM multiple times, uh, Union of BC Municipalities for those at home, um, where, you know, ask can be made of the province. For the most part, they ask of changing the, the provincial default from 50 to 40, which has been a significantly, not universal, but pretty consistent among urban, uh, has been pushed back very hard by rural who don't see it as, as practical. And so it's typically failed at the UBCM on that kind of split. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that came back was, could we, could we do something else? Could we try this as a pilot to look at it more on a regional basis? And so the province did amend the ability to run a pilot project for default speed limits, and that's essentially the process that, that Esquimalt is looking at doing is, is, is undertaking a pilot project for a default speed limit. I hope that just gives a little clarity in some of the, the efforts over the years to try and get there. Go ahead, Councillor Watson, sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, not an interruption at all. That was helpful from uh, both Mr. Rennick and the Mayor. Um, so I, I guess since we're, this is not a pilot, this is us, a uh, proposal to adopt a bylaw, does that then mean, so the idea is here that we sort of um, spread the cost of doing this and the signage over some period of time because we're going to introduce different uh, collector roads at different times, and that's why they're named in the bylaw? Mr. Rennick? Through you, Mayor, the reason that the individual roads are named in the bylaw is because we are not following the pilot project approach. We are following the Motor Vehicle Act 
you may lower a speed limit by bylaw. With respect to the cost, uh, the cost is not that significant relative to the overall transportation safety improvements budget that council has approved in this year's capital program. Doing the signs on these specific roads can be accommodated within this year's budget, within this year's work plan. We have also reached out to ICBC, who has a program called the Road Improvement Program. They have not confirmed exactly how much funds will be made available, but they will make a contribution to defray some of the cost of the new signage. Thank you. And just finally, one other uh, sort of question or observation. You did mention Victoria as going ahead and maybe doing something differently. And you mentioned in the report, or I think in your remarks, um, the concern about sign clutter. And I would have to say that in Victoria, we have terrible sign clutter now because of the introduction of so many different schemes for bike lanes um, that affect both cyclists and drivers, plus the speed limit signs, plus all sorts of other things. So um, uh, do we have any control over the distancing between these signs we put up, or how many, or is that all stipulated provincially? Mr. Rennick? Through you, Mayor, it's not so much that it's a provincial stipulation, it's more that it's through proper engineering practice. You basically want any way that a person can get onto a road that they're able to see what the speed limit is relatively quickly. So it would be a question of sight distances and um, are there curves, are there hills. In terms of the City of Victoria approach, what their council directed was to start with side streets any street that has no center line and has, I believe, fewer than 1,000 vehicles per day, they are changing those streets to 30 kilometers per hour and they're putting up signs. We're kind of doing the opposite. And the reason for that is that most of the side streets in Oak Bay, particularly South Oak Bay, if you look at your Smythes, your Beaver Brooks, your Guernseys, your Lafayettes, I question whether anyone could even do more than 30 kilometers on one of those. Uh, and so it almost feels, you know, on paper, those are 50 kilometer per hour roads, but please don't try it. Thank you very much. I, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you for the report, uh, Mr. Rennick. Just um, a follow up on Councillor Watson's question. So the installation, we may get some assistance with, but the ongoing maintenance of the signs, how, like, the, the more signs we get, the more maintenance it is, is occurring, and so, um, what's on the horizon for maintenance costs rising for all the signage we have? Mr. Rennick? Through you, Mayor, there is not a great deal of maintenance that you do on a speed limit sign. Uh, if they get tagged, you take them down and put, on a, put up a new one. The overall inventory of signs that Mr. Brozick keeps upstairs at the Public Works Yard, I don't think will be significantly impacted by adding a handful more 40K signs. Thank you for that. Uh, are there any other questions of Mr. Rennick? I have, oh, I'm going to go to first time questions, so I'll go to myself first and then I'll come back to, to you, Councillor Smart. Um, I just uh, want to make sure I'm 100% I'm, uh, considering, as a person representing the Regional Transit Commission, uh, I just want to make sure that, that there is no concerns raised by, regional, by the uh, BC Transit. I know it, in the report it talks to that, but I just want to make absolutely sure that conversation has happened and that none of the, the, uh, the routes are going to be changed as a result of this. Mr. Rennick? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did reach out to a transit planner, uh, one of my colleagues at BC Transit. He did not believe that there would be a significant impact on any of the routes by lowering the speed limits. Given the proximity of the stops, I don't think the buses regularly get up to 50 kilometers per hour anyways. Their impression was that any impact on route timing would be minor, and at best, they have to tweak one or two time points on the schedules. They did not foresee it having impacts on which streets have bus stops or the general frequency of those routes. Right, thank you. And uh, just also for confirmation for those who didn't read the report, maybe sitting at home, uh, the routes that are listed on here in that uh, assessment at the 85th percentile, um, Almost all these, sets, both roads and sections, actually did fall within that that range currently. Is that correct? We're not looking at changing the behavior so much as we are uh, matching the, the speed limits to the actuals that people drive. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. 
the vast majority of these streets, when they have been studied, we've found 85th percentile speeds between 40 and 50. I'm reminded of a joke when we were tasked, asked to, to change the speed limit on granite, and it was 50, and people wanted a 40 kilometer sign. Uh, someone quip equipped, well, why do you want to raise the speed limit? Or why do you want to people to drive faster? Because the 85th percentile was, I think, 37 per, uh, kilometers an hour at the time. So uh, it does, uh, I think, yeah, anyway, I'll leave that there. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Oh, Councillor, sorry, Councillor Smart. And then, uh, and then Appleton. Oh, sorry, I should go to Appleton first and then Smart. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Just go, go ahead, Councillor Smart. <laughs> We're all too polite here. Through you, Mayor and Mr. Rennick. Um, I don't feel like I'm 100% um, clear when I compare the draft um, report to the two maps that are included. And I understand the first map is the actual document from the OCP. And to me, that, that one is rather clear um, with the green lines as to what are the collectors. But the um, proposed speed limit change map, um, I can't quite um, clearly understand, because there's quite a few different speed zones that are listed there. Um, what exactly is proposed to be changed in map format? It doesn't quite seem to match up to the draft for me. And if you could just add a little bit of clarity, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Rennick? Through you, Mayor. I will apologize that map was fairly hastily whipped up while I was working from home this morning. One of the approaches that we tried to take was that we didn't want to raise any speed limits. So there are sections of our collector roads that are already signed lower than 40. For example, Newport Avenue is an OCP collector that for what I assume are historical reasons is signed at 35 kilometers per hour. We're leaving that one alone. The portions of Estevan that go through Estevan Village that are 30K, the portion of Musgrave that goes by Willow School that's 30K, some of those we were keeping them the way that they were. So it was really an exercise of kind of taking those two maps, the speed zones as they exist and the OCP and trying to compare and harmonize the two and just get to anything that's not already 40 or lower and is a collector shall become 40. Thank you. Is that clear, Councillor Smart? Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, in a sense, I can ignore looking at the 20, 30, and 35K. Those are not actually going to be signed under this. Um, we're, I'm only looking at the blue on that last map, I believe. Mr. Uh Through you, I believe I did like a greeny yellow highlight zone on the, on the map. That's indicating what zones are, are changing. This is the uh, the district speed zones highlighted streets will be lowered to 40 kilometers an hour. That's the, yeah. I think there's something weird about that overlay. Mm -hmm. It doesn't show up on the on the, when it got converted. Uh, I believe that there could be a, a technical problem with that. The version of the image that Ms. Williams just showed me on her phone looks. Yes, that's the that's uh -huh. the greeny yellow to which I was referring. God bless technology, which just always throws a wrinkle into everything at some point or another. And so what's showing now, for instance, you can see on Estevan Avenue, which is on the middle of the page, I've left alone that light blue section because the light blue is the 30K for Estevan Village. So we're going to leave that as 30K. But the sections of Estevan Avenue on either side, which are currently unsigned, would be signed 40. That's reasonably clearer for sure. Thank you. Very odd. It doesn't show up on our, our package. Yeah, that's, that's bizarre. Is there any other? Maybe because that's within the uh, Adobe app as opposed to within the interpret whatever the Adobe reader is within the our app. But anyway, uh, Councillor Appleton, I think I'll go over to you. 
Uh, thank you, Worship. It was actually related to this because it was it was a similar question about sort of being confused about some of the roads. So, and of course, I focus in on Windsor because that's where I live. But I'm not sure what the Windsor's also highlighted there because it uh, that would be a collector road as well. So, thank you. I think we can confirm that is yes. Um, yes, Windsor is included and. Uh, Technically, only the part from Victoria Avenue to Beach is a collector, but we just put all of Windsor Road in the bylaw and that very small cul-de-sac at the <laughs> western end. Uh, I don't think folks were doing 50 on it, but it's included. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, okay, thank you. Just, I guess I have one last follow-up question on this one. It's just, I mean, we've, and appreciate the sort of you know engineering driven approach to this where we're, we did a study we've got the, re the recommendations for this uh, following this now we have this the, the bylaws to align with that is there anything uh, that isn't that's included in here that maybe isn't included as part of the uh, ICBC report or vice versa anything that the ICBC report recommended that isn't included in this bylaw change outside of the obviously the broader 40 kilometer an hour change Mr. Rennick uh, no, there isn't, as you say, outside of the broader 40 kilometer per hour change. So there are four classes of roads in the Oak Bay official community plan. Arterials, which are the fastest and busiest, and those were to remain 50. Collectors, which are the next busiest, that's what's on the docket tonight. Specials, which are a class of road that don't really fit into other categories, and those are King George Terrace, which is already 30. Oak Bay Avenue, which is already 40, and Beach Drive, which was part 50, part 40, and we changed it to make it all 40 at the end of 2021. So we've covered off the specials. We, if this bylaw is passed, we'll cover off the collectors. And then it's just the locals that we need to come up with a strategy for, because I don't think that there's much appetite to do, you know, the 75 kilometers worth of locals and sign every single street. Thank you for that, Mr. Rennick. Uh, Council Braithwaite, you haven't had a chance to speak yet, so if you have anything, any questions to ask, this is the time to do it. Otherwise, I'll go to the public and then back to the table for comments. Um, thank you. All my questions have been answered. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we have a natural pause here. It looks. Oh, Councillor Appleton, do you have more? Uh, no, that's that's okay. This is de de delving into the realm of esoterica, your worship, but you'll feel indulge, indulge me. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming by the fact that we have a road in Oak Bay that's designated at 35 kilometers an hour sort of seems to imply that the uh, municipalities can set speeds as to their discretion and don't have to do it along any particular standard. I, I thought that somewhere buried in the traffic code was something that you had to do these things in 10 kilometer an hour inch increments, but apparently that's not the case. So um, is, is is there any guidance that's 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 uh, given to us in that regard, or do we just, elect, we could set it at 27 kilometers an hour if we wanted to. Or in this case, maybe 39. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Rennick. Through you, Mayor, I'm not aware that there is a specific requirement for speed limits to end in zeros. It certainly is what's done in the vast majority of our nation. The 35 kilometer per hour on Newport is just kind of a local curio, I guess. We actually had considered when we brought this report suggesting that Newport be raised to 40, but ultimately decided we're not here to raise any speed limits. So we're just going to leave that one alone. Anything? No, good. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just turn to the public. Nobody I see on my screen has indicated they wish to address council on this matter. Ms. Bagnall just confirming. Okay, confirmed. So we're back to this table for uh, discussion. I think we're just good to get the motion to receive on the floor, and then we have something to speak to. Move receipt, your worship. Move seconded. Thank you. So really, all any of the uh, any of the pieces here, happy to take uh, comments on, Councillor. I think Councillor uh, Patterson, did you wish to speak? Councillor. Okay. Well, no, I'm not calling the question yet. So the motion to receive is is on the table. But I think this is a chance for us to discuss any portions of this. If there's any concerns or ideas raised, we can do them here, and then I'll, we'll walk through the motions. But it, this isn't one of these ones where each individual motion is so separated that we can't have the conversation. So is there any conversation on this, or should we move to the uh, moving through? 
Okay, I will call the question on receipt. All those in favor of receipt? Councilor Braithwaite, I'm taking you as in affirmative unless otherwise noted. Um, Thank you. That the the second part is uh, is going to the bylaw itself. Uh, so in this one, we'll take first and second reading, and then we'll have discussion uh, on the bylaw itself. Your we'll Worship, I would move to give first and second reading to Streets and Traffic Bylaw Number Forty One Hundred Two Thousand Amendment Bylaw Number Four Eight Three Six Twenty Twenty Three to add new forty kilometer an hour speed zones. Is there a second or seconded? Thank you. Any other discussion? Councillor Smart. Yeah, so I, I will be supporting this, um, but I, I do have a little bit of concern over the exhaustion of residents to change limits and potentially change them again with the cycling infrastructure, but I think that the strength of this um, exceeds that concern. Thank you. Anything else? Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Oh, thank you, Worship. I, I just find this eminently supportable. I thank staff for bringing it forward and coming up with a, a good approach. I think this is a good tactical and stepwise approach to, to doing this. Um, I think targeting the collector roads is a is a good one. I think a lot of the collector roads, although ind indicated as such, um, you know, often get used more like more like arterials. People drive on them more like arterials. They they people tend to overestimate the amount of, of room and space that they have on a lot of these collector roads. I know, you know, Monterey and obviously have done, being on Windsor, there's a, it's, it's, it's busy. So I think in general, uh, the idea of, of lowering speed limits on, on, on the collector roads is, yeah, eminently supportable. It's an excellent approach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to just also just speak as a comment because I think one of the you know, they're really nice ways. We have we don't have a lot of traffic change orders and things come to this table, and a lot of what we do is along these lines where we bring in expertise to guide us. We look at the engineering requirements. I appreciate your your thoughtful and, and detailed answers, uh, Mr. Rennick, on these things. Um, it makes these sort of decisions much more uh, very supportable, very understandable, and I think to the general public understand that it's being driven by um, by best practices and by um, by public safety and by other things that aren't just. Um, you know, non-experts coming up with with solutions. We're, we're sort of relying on the experts and, and implementing them as they come forward. So I just really appreciate the the attention to detail in this. I think one of the reasons we're having a real reasonably short debate on this tonight is that we're um, the preparation that's been done ahead of time. So thank you. I'll call the question on first. Oh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor. Just one comment. I just think to help the public, it would be great if we could get that map updated so that if folks refer to it, um, they can actually see those yellow lines so that as opposed to just reading the names of the streets because of the some of them were already included in, but parts were additions. So that would be a, a, a helpful add from staff. Thank you. Uh, I think it's actually on the people look at it through a, a PDF reader. It'll be fine. It's just our app that's having the issue, but we'll double check that to make sure that that's the case. Mr. Rennick, is that sufficient? Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I will touch base with the corporate services team and ensure that what is published after the fact uh, reflects my authorial intent. Thank you for that. Uh, not seeing any other hands, I'll call the question on first and second reading. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Then we have third reading. Worship, I would move third reading of uh, Streets and Traffic Bylaw Number 4100, Amendment Bylaw Number 4836. Seconded. Thank you. We don't usually debate things after second reading. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Thank you for that. Uh, and then we have the last recommendation here, and I, which is to continue to partner with other local governments in the region to advocate. I would move that recommendation, Your Worship. Is there a seconder? Moving seconded. Any discussion on that? Uh, seeing any, all those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Uh, that concludes the recommendations within the report. Unless there's anything else arising, I'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council. Mr. Rennick, take care. I understand you need to get back anyway, so I hope that wasn't too late. <laughs> I will do so, yes. Or walk slowly. Since there's a know. small baby at home with his uncle, so yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, we move on to item number 10.1, which are, uh, if, if you were... Looking at the agenda order earlier, uh, this was later in this, this followed some of the finance pieces, so we moved it under uh, section 10 because it actually isn't subject to public input at this point. Uh, so we're dealing with this first. Uh, this is for 2072 Meadow Place. Um, Mr. Muller, uh, welcome. Mayor, Council. Um, 
the district has received a, a, a development variance permit application for a 2072 Meadow Place. Um, this application is to give notice uh, or to allow to give notice for um, the development variance permit. Um, the, per the application is to vary section 4.7 of the parking facilities bylaw, which requires one half of the, the parking um, required for a dwelling unit to be covered or in located inside of a, build a building. Um, as per Schedule A, uh, the parking facilities bylaw, there's two spaces required for per dwelling unit. Um, there's a home daycare on the site, but there is no uh, additional parking required for home daycares as far as, as far as our parking facilities bylaw requirements go. Um, we believe that the intent of the parking facilities bylaw to cover half of the parking is to reduce the, the visual appearance, or to improve the visual appearance uh, in streetscaping, to have less parked vehicles on in front of homes. Um, as well as the small garages are part of the Oak Bay character. Um, Meadow Place, uh, um, the Meadow Place cul-de-sac is has more exposed um, driveways as, uh, and with minimal screening, and um, there's more uh, parked cars uh, out front of the, the, the homes. And so this 2072 is not um, in contrary to the its, its immediate neighbors. Uh, there's an existing cement driveway um, on, in front of the home that one side slopes down about a meter in, in above natural grade, and the other side is flush with natural grade. Um, it provides ample parking, or the two parking, uh, uh, two, two parking stall requirement um, with, that exceed the required dimension for, from the parking facilities bylaw. Uh, so, if council decided decides to move forward with this the development per permit today, the, the neighboring properties within 50. 50, <clears throat> excuse me, 50 meters of the subject property would be uh, notified of the, the intent of this development variance permit and allowed to provide uh, public input and we would return back to council at, a, at the next available council date. Thank you very much, Mr. Muller. And just for I, to reiterate that for people watching and wondering why there's no public input at this particular meeting, uh, development variance permits come to this table. We look at them, give them a, a once over and see if they, we think they meet on the face of it, the needs of the community. Uh, and deserve to have the public input. Uh, if the board here agrees that they they do, uh, it'll go out for notification, come back here, and at that point, uh, both a written and in-person public input is welcome uh, on these uh, variance permits. So uh, with that, uh, are there any questions of Mr. Muller? I think the report's fairly clear in terms of what the ask is. Uh, okay, so no questions. Um, Perhaps we'll just get to a, uh, we'll have a motion to receive the report and then we can have any further debate on this evaluation. Move receipt, your worship. Moved and seconded. Need a hand for seconding. Oh, thank you. Uh, so on the application, is there any questions of staff or any comments that people wish to make? Not seeing any. I think this is fairly straightforward. Uh, with that, then I will call the question. On the receipt only of the report at this point, all those in favor of receipt, any opposed, not opposed, and then we have, uh, the next recommendation to, to direction to give notice. Oh, Your Worship, I would move that Council direct the notice be given of consideration of DVP 00130 for the property located at 2072 Meadow Place. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Need a little. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, any other discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. So that carries. We will hear back from the applicants in a couple of weeks. Uh, we are moving on now to section 11, uh, which is uh, is available for public input. These are primarily the financial bylaws and pieces attached to uh, the previous work done over the last couple of months on uh, through a budgeting process. I think it's probably worthwhile to have uh, Mr. Payne provide a, a quick overview. Uh, you can do them all at once, Mr. Payne, or you can just uh, deal them with them uh, as we go. The first item on the agenda is the uh, five-year financial plan for 2023-2027. Welcome to the meeting. And for those at home, uh, Mr. Payne is our Director of uh, Financial Services and Asset Management. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship Council. Uh, Council has Bylaw 4833 before them, recommended for uh, first three readings. This is our financial plan bylaw. Uh, the, bu the bylaw is a summarized uh, formal version of the budget that's been presented to Council throughout March uh, and contains all the adjustments that were directed by Council through the committee uh, during that time. Uh, the changes result in a final um, tax increase of 9.2%. Uh, 
The key differences between the bylaw and what uh, Council saw in the budget document is uh, threefold. First of all, the level of detail is much more higher, higher level in the bylaw. Um, the, it sets our overall expenditure limits and thus um, we prepared at a high level to support flexibility should Council wish um, uh, to make any amendments throughout the year. A bylaw amendment, a, a formal bylaw amendment would not be necessary um, if we have uh, a good flexibility in the bylaw. Uh, secondly, we include amortization, and amortization is um, a non-cash expense, which basically demonstrates the wearing out of our assets over their useful life. That's not a required expense uh, for us to budget for under the community charter, uh, but it is something that we must report actuals in our financial statements at the end of the year. So just to create that comparability, we incorporate that into our financial plan bylaw. Uh, so that actuals versus budget at the end of the year uh, can be compared. And lastly, the COVID-19 restart grant is presented as a grant in the financial uh, plan, um, the document, uh, but really it's uh, a fairly unrestricted uh, grant and, and so it has been recognized as revenue and, and in reality it's a transfer from a reserve. So we've set it aside in a reserve per the provincial requirements and so in the bylaw it's uh, demonstrated that way. Uh, so the community charter requires that this bylaw be adopted uh, before the tax rate bylaw and by May 14th. Uh, thus council is asked to be provided or asked to pr uh, provide three readings today. Uh, and that would give us time for adoption, our final adoption on May 8th. Uh, should Council wish not to provide three readings today, um, we would just require a special meeting at some point between now and uh, the May 8th meeting to uh, adopt the bylaw per the Community Charter. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. May 15th, I believe, is our cutoff date for submission of the approved financial plan. Is that correct? Uh, the Community Charter says before May 15th, so May 14th is the day it must be adopted. Worship. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from members of council to Mr. Payne? And I'll go out. Oh, go ahead. And just a reminder for any members of the public who do wish to, who did not bring up questions or comments during the uh, budgeting process, or even if you did, uh, you're more than welcome to come at this point to any of these items uh, as we're contemplating the reading of the bylaws here again tonight. So if you're online, you're more than welcome to uh, to reach out and, and raise your hand either through the app or through the 1855 number. Sorry for the interruption, but go ahead, uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to Mr. Payne. Um, just uh, this is a question hot on the heels of the CRD presentation, where they revealed what their plans and their 3.2 percent increase. And I just wondered. This may totally put you on the spot, and you won't be able to answer. But if you can, or even ballpark it, how will, because of these two relative rates, how what will the the proportion for the average or the median taxpayer in Oak Bay, what will the distribution be between the CRD charge and the local charge be on that typical tax bill, given our two respective differences in rate increases? Each year, and just so I'm clear that Mr. Payne is asking, if we're all understanding the question and the right answer, you're saying that the tax bill comes and includes everything. So we have a higher increase than the CRD does. So what is the blended rate effectively given the percentages? Is that OK? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Payne? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I can put it in broad context, I think, for you uh, quite well. The um, average municipal taxes, so that's the taxes that we levy and we have control over, um, exceeds about $3,000 per median residential property. Um, I believe Mr. Chan uh, presented a number around $800 for the CRD. Uh, so yes, our increase is 9.2%. They don't have uh, an increase. Uh, so it will bring down the overall tax increase of the entire bill, but you can kind of put it into um, perspective considering that their taxes are about one quarter of what our taxes are. So. Thank you. Are there any other questions on of staff at this point? I don't see any. So I'm going to take a motion to receive the report first. Move receipt, Your Worship. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any discussion on receiving the report? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed, unopposed? And then we need again to do first and second reading before we do third reading. Your Worship, I would move that tax rates bylaw. Are we starting with tax rates bylaw? No, uh, we're starting with plan. financial plan bylaw. Uh, number 4833 be given first and second readings. 
Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Braithwaite, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to uh, make a comment um, to Mr. Uh, Payne to say thank you so very much yet again for making this um, financial plan uh, so readable and so understandable. Um, it's just a joy to be able to kind of go through it. And um, I'm sure for our public as well, it makes it just so much easier for them to understand everything that's going on. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Councillor Braithwaite. I'm not sure I would go so far as a joy, but we'll... Uh, we'll... <laughs> Take that, uh, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And and at the risk of reiterating what Councillor Braithwaite has said, um, I always find this point in the financial uh, planning process somewhat anticlimactic because the fin as Mr. Payne has described, the financial plan bylaw itself is relatively simple compared to the amount of work that goes into getting to this number. So I guess I would encourage those members of the public um, that are referring to this and members of the public that have watched the financial planning process closely given how challenging it's been to to deal with the tax increase and and things of that nature um, this is the the simple culmination of a lot of work um, for which we're very very appreciative and members of the public i would just redirect them back to the financial planning materials uh, that mr payne and team have created and and all of the detail that it provides um, just just for that context what what this reminds us of is is that this is as much as is required legally to provide as far as a, a financial plan, but we're now blessed with, you know, a very, very detailed and very uh, user-friendly document to interpret what these numbers mean. So I'm just going to extend my thanks again to Mr. Payne and his team and, and to all the staff that supported this and, and really encourage the members of the public to check out the materials that's been presented because ours are, are some of the best um, in this part of the world. So thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. I'm getting better every year, which is a nice part. Um, so we have first two readings of the Financial Plan Bylaw 2023-2027. Uh, any other discussion? See, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, and then for third reading? Your Worship, I would move third reading of Financial Plan Bylaw 2023-2027, number 4833. Moved and seconded. Do I have a seconder? Thank you. Uh, we don't usually debate on third, so I'll just call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. That carries. Uh, moving on to 11.2 Boulevard frontage tax rates. Mr. Payne. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I just um, prepare a bit of comments around uh, what this is, similar to our discussion during the financial planning process. Uh, the Boulevard tax rate bylaw. Uh, recovers a portion of our boule uh, boulevard uh, maintenance costs. Uh, we aim to recover about 75% of that from this tax. The theory is that about 25% of our boulevard um, is that is maintained by the district. It doesn't benefit a specific property to have it maintained. Uh, it doesn't abut a uh, specific property. Uh, so the idea is that 75% of the boulevards do and, and there is a, benef a direct benefit. Um, the, our recovery rate has been below the 75% threshold for many years. We've been phasing in increases to get back to that uh, threshold. This will get us about up to 67%. Uh, the uh, legislative timeline for this bylaw, very similar to the financial plan bylaw, only difference is it has to be adopted after. Uh, it can be the same date, but uh, it has to be adopted after the financial plan bylaw. So if council uh, uh, adopts this bylaw, it would increase our boulevard revenue from $232,000 to approximately $256,000. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, Mr. Payne, on this? I see no hands, so perhaps a motion to receive. A motion to receive the staff report, Your Worship. Is there a seconder? Thank you. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion on receipt or on the, on the Boulevard frontage checks at large? I'm happy to take either comments. No, don't see any. I'll call the question then on receipt. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed, and then we, if we could do the honors, Councillor Appleton. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. So I would move that uh, Council give first and second readings to Boulevard Frontage Tax Amendment Bylaw 2023, number 4835. Moved and seconded. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion on this? Go ahead, Councillor. Yes, just a question of clarification, uh, Mayor, through you to Mr. Payne. Are these the um, the charges that apply to those um, homeowners who've agreed to be part of the provision of these services? 
and can they, how, um, if they um, wanted to opt out, when would be the next opportunity that they, they could do that and not be charged? Thanks, Councillor Watson. Mr. Payne. Uh, Your Worship, yeah, there's a th uh, there is a threshold uh, that um, uh, uh, um, taxpayers can exceed to opt out of the service, and it's done block by block. So it's essentially 50% of the assessed value of that block and 50% of the citizens on that block, if they vote to uh, be removed, they can be removed. When, they, when uh, such a tax is introduced in the first place, they're given that opportunity to not accept that tax under the same conditions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before I call the question, I want to make sure that uh, I'm looking on my screen here. I see no public input. Uh, raise your hands here for, for things. So I just want to make sure we've we're clear on that. Before we move on, I call the question. Is there Councillor Upton? Did I see you wanted to speak? No. Okay. Uh, with that, then I will call this first and second reading of the bylaw number four eight three five. All those in favor? Any opposed? Not opposed. Yeah, can I move third reading of Boulevard Frontage Tax Amendment Bylaw number 4835, Your Worship? Third seconder. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, don't typically dis debate after second reading, so all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, and then moving on to 10.3, Tax Rates Bylaw 2023. Sorry, Mr. Payne, I should have had time. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. We're getting into a rhythm there. I didn't think I needed to say your name one more time. Please, go ahead. Tax rate rhythm. Uh, your Worship, um, the, the only additional comments I would provide in, in, in regard to the uh, tax rate bylaw is Council may notice that it levies taxes for our general municipal uh, purposes as well. And consistent with what you heard of the CRD uh, presentation, we also are required to develop the tax rates to recover um, the CRD costs that are imposed on us from them. The regional district doesn't have taxing authority, so they just hand us a bill. And, and we're expected to pay for it, and we levy a tax to pay for it. And you also note the Oak Bay uh, Village Business Improvement Area tax is levied pursuant to this bylaw as well. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Uh, again, many members of the public who wish to address either by question or comment to Council on this matter, you can do so now. Um, before we end, as people, if anybody wishes to call in, I'll give a moment here for any members of Council to ask questions of staff. see any um, actually maybe just one quick question for my uh, our edification here the relative rate of, of each individual say um, the business versus residential rate um, is the policy that we've uh, is the result of this end up with everybody gets the same percentage uplift or is the result of this that the um, the numbers have to the, 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 the effective ratio uh, stays the same between the various classes uh, thank you, Your Worship, and excellent uh, question. Um, our policy is to pass on the exact same tax increase to all classes, so the 9-2% across the board to all tax classes. Uh, the ratio method is less common, especially in the regional district, only because uh, residential assessments um, are climbing at a very fast rate. Um, such to maintain previous year's ratios would uh, essentially... Um, decrease taxes in the other classes. Uh, although we do have a very small tax base outside of the residential class. Um, so, so that method um, really compounds the increase to your residential class if you're using the, the ratio method. Um, and the only exception to that, Your Worship, would be the farm class tax rate, which is meant to harmonize what would be uh, charged on um, that property if it were classified as a residential property. So from occasion, uh, occasionally we adjust that tax rate um, in a uh, uh, non-uniform uh, method. Um, last year, I believe, was an example of that. We went back and looked at the farm class uh, property in, in our municipality, uh, determined what the uh, residential assessment would be and determine the farm class rate accordingly. And that, that's a policy in our financial plan bylaw. Okay, thank you very much for that. Yeah, Councillor Smart. I'm just um, through you, Mayor, just building upon that, Mr. Payne, could you explain a little bit um, with um, tax exemptions, um, who, like who has control um, over that? Because I gather it's, it's provincial, not municipal, and, and also just... Um, 
with regards to how that impacts or doesn't impact what Oak Bay receives um, for taxes. Dean? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, through your worship. Um, there are, uh, broadly speaking, there's two uh, uh, there's two classes of exemptions, um, uh, w uh, one being statutory exemptions, and those are s exemptions that are, uh, I would say, imposed on the district uh, where we have no say, uh, and those exemptions reduce the taxable value of a property pursuant to provincial legislation as the normal method. And then the second would be permissive tax exemptions, and that's where the district has the ability to pass a bylaw uh, to provide exemptions. We do have a permissive tax exemption bylaw. Um, not, there's uh, uh, not a lot of uh, property taxes that are provided with tax exemptions through our bylaw, uh, but there are several um, dozen, um, dozens of different ta uh, statutory ta tax exemptions that are applied to the assessment rule that are outside of our um, ability to influence. Mr. Smart. Well, thank you for that. And just to expand upon that a bit without being exhaustive, could you give um, an, an example of what a, st a statutory one might be and also just with regards to the permissive ones, is that publicly available information? Mr. Payton. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, through Your Worship, a great uh, question. Um, some examples of statutory ta uh, tax exemptions would be provincially owned buildings, federally owned buildings, federal parks. Um, the universities have their own um, legislation that exempt them from taxes, BC Hydro. Um, you know, Crown Corporations uh, essentially uh, are exempt from taxes. Sometimes they give us a grant in lieu in return for that exemption, but th those do exist. There's also uh, uh, broad exemptions for uh, church buildings and the land directly beneath the footprint of the of the building, um, uh, and uh, 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 private schools. Same sa uh, same with uh, private schools as well, or independent schools. Uh, and uh, to answer your question in terms of permissive tax exemptions, yes, that's a public uh, process. The, first of all, uh, the bylaw has to be adopted, which is a public process, but we're also required to report out on our permissive tax exemptions annually in our annual report. Thank you. I don't see any other members of the public who have addressed us wishing to ask questions or make comments. So um, at this point, I'll just take a motion to receive the report. So moved, Your Worship. Moved. Is there a seconder? Seconded, thank you. Uh, any, uh, now that we've gone past the questions, are there any other comments or pieces, debate that wishes to happen on this? Don't see anything. I will call the question then for receipt. All those in favor? Any opposed, not opposed? Uh, Councillor Appleton, you've done a very good job so far. Why don't you continue? Thank you, Worship. I'm, I'm filling in for Councillor Braithwaite here. This is usually <laughs> Councillor Braithwaite's role. Um, I would move that tax rates bylaw 2023, number 4834, be given first and second readings. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Moved and seconded. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed, unopposed, and third reading? Thank you, Worship. I would move the tax rates bylaw 2023, number 4834, be given third reading. And seconded. Thank you. Again, don't usually debate if there's no debate on second reading. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Um, we have uh, new business next under section 12. Councillor Smart. Yeah, I'm just I'm interested in um, uh, doing a motion ar arising in light of yet another DVP application with regards to um, housing half of the parking requirements for one and and two dwelling units to be within a building. I can I can just expand. I didn't hear the, no yeah. I didn't hear oh. a motion there, so I just uh, yeah want sorry to <laughs> yeah sorry. Um, the motion arising has to be an actual motion. So. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to direct uh, staff to do a housekeeping amendment to the parking bylaw to eliminate the requirements to house half of the required parking spaces for one and two story um, uh, dwellings to be located within a building. Uh, so the requirement to have a garage or a carport, essentially, that's an, a part of the things. Uh, Okay, do you want to do this as a motion or do you want to do it as a notice of motion? I'd like to do it as a motion arising. Okay. Uh, so the motion is to make those changes. I might just, well, is there a, uh, return to staff. I'm not sure it's a housekeeping item, but we'll, uh, I'll see if there's a seconder for the motion as it stands. Do I just 
Yeah, please go ahead for clarity. Just, just for clarity, just uh, with respect to the motion, this is amend uh, proposed amendment to the parking bylaw. Is that what I heard? Correct. It would be a, a um, proposed um, amendment to the parking bylaw. Second in for discussion. Yeah, moved and seconded. Um, and Mr. Bowles, I, it did, the motion didn't actually specify which bylaws. Just that. I can just read the motion aloud again, so we have it on the on the floor. Uh, to direct staff to undertake a housing um, housekeeping amendment to the parking bylaw to eliminate the requirement to house one half of the required parking spaces for one and two fa one and two family dwellings to be located within a building. Okay. I'm, ju I'm just I'm, I'm just thinking about the housekeeping term. Uh, if that's actually appropriate, because there's no such, is there's no technical thing for that. So, but that's okay. I think I can. Should it stay in there, or should it just be dropped in terms of a motion to make to change a bylaw? I find some of those words are like friendly amendments. There's just amendments. There's no such thing. So, sometimes it's just you know, on on actual formal motion, I might just ask that that may not be included in there. But I don't know if it makes any difference from staff's perspective. If it is or is not, Mr. Bull, it doesn't make any difference. So, if you wish to leave it in there, you can, Councillor Smart. Okay. Um, yeah, whatever, um, whichever um, staff feels is more appropriate. So we can bring this up on screen. Zoom in a little bit. Councillor Smart, uh, feel free to motivate. Um, since the beginning of my term, there have been um, several um, projects that have been involved a lot of uh, staff and council time coming forward centered around this, this one issue, and I, I felt tonight having it come forward again that it was worth some discussion at the table um, around whether um, we could uh, be more efficient with everybody's time um, to focus staff and council time on more important uh, issues. Um, I also just with regards to um, climate, um, I, I feel like uh, asking people to create a building for a, a motor vehicle um, doesn't align with our current council priorities. Um, it seems that we are not quite clear on even the original intent of this bylaw. Um, this bylaw also is not something that I'm aware of as in any other municipality. Um, and, I, and I note that there are a lot of non-conforming houses in Oak Bay and it is not actually enforced. Um, and if the original intent was to screen the car from site, we don't, this bylaw does not actually achieve that because it does not require people to actually park in their garage. Smart. Are there any other questions of staff or of the mover? Let's make way, Councillor Appleton. Uh, more just a comment here, Your Worship. Just just referring to the uh, just for for precision. Um, I get I and I probably this is probably the intent, but I'll ask the mover of the of the motion. To, the 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 bylaw actually states that one half of the parking has to be located within a building, mm -hmm. and I think that that was the intent uh, rather than than dwelling because I know that we have some uh, dwelling well built houses that where the parking is in fact within the dwelling but in most plate cases in my case it's a garage so yes I that change is acceptable if the mover and seconder are okay with that uh, piece is there other discussion here on the motion that's in front of us yeah, go ahead, Councillor Watson. I have a comment as well. Go ahead. Um, I support the general direction here and have observed myself that um, I think it's four of these DVPs that of this nature that have come before us uh, in this term of council. And I do think that um, some of them have arisen, I think maybe I could say all of them may have arisen um, because there was some other activity taking place that required a permit and then it came to the attention of our staff that something was amiss with respect to this particular aspect of our bylaws. And I do think it is a, it's an unfortunate use of staff time, particularly given in all four cases, we ended up with a, it was just became sort of a pre, pro forma review. Um, I, I, I'm almost prepared to support this on the spot, but I do uh, wonder about the, 
um, when we have two family dwellings and we're talking about a total of four parking spaces as opposed to just two. And I, I would have no difficulty if we were just talking about those situations where the actual parking requirement was two spaces. And so we then did not uh, need to have any other parking provision for them. Um, but I, I, I n not, not understanding th the total spread of the impact of this change throughout the municipality, I would be a bit hesitant to go whole hog without having a bit more information. So I, uh, while I totally support the direction, um, and, I, and I hear your comments about we have absolutely no control what people do with the, the parking, the, the covered parking spaces that they are required to provide, and we know that many people use them for all sorts of other things than vehicles. Um, I'm not sure I would be ready to leap forward tonight, although I, like an, I, I do like the idea of a nice, quick, tidy way to do it. Thank you, Councillor Watson. I'll just uh, throw in here. I think I appreciate the uh, the simplicity of this. I, I do think, though, I don't see it as a housekeeping. I guess that's probably my uh, my piece here. I think this is one of those changes that does would have significant public uh, interest, and I would certainly like to see it have public input. And if we're undertaking broader zoning uh, review process, I think this is a logical one for us to contemplate that. I don't think it's ever as quite as simple as it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not good or bad to have this bylaw. Obviously, it has its pros and cons. Uh, obviously, it does have provide for a building uh, uh, space for that houses a car. You could argue that's not worthwhile. At the same time, those houses off housing of the car extends their life considerably. And is that such a bad thing after all? And they also often provide, as noted, even we're not using for vehicles, they're often a, a nice sort of bridge between indoor and outdoor space that, uh, yes, one family may not use it, but another active family uh, would have a place to put their bikes and their kayaks and those other pieces that are often uh, not built into living spaces and houses that provide sort of a wet, dry space. So I, I'm not, I, I think the ability for people to make a case that they don't need it is necessary. Uh, we have had quite a few of these come forward in the last few months for some reason. These are the nature of, uh, of of land use, where these things seem to come in little waves, and then we won't see another one for another four years. Um, I don't think you should take this as an extrapolated trend. I think this is just probably, uh, we'll probably see a few more of them as we sort of uncover uh, some existing and, and look at that when, when sweet building permits and so forth come forward. But I'm not convinced that this is necessary to just move it forward without, a, without some meaningful public consultation process. And I would see that would be done as part of our, our zoning bylaw piece. So I'm not I'm having a hard time supporting it just coming forward without the, the pieces. I think there's arguments to be made to not do it. We also have, um, yeah, I guess that's, I'll just leave it there. Is there anybody else? There's the council. Oh, Councillor Braithwaite, then Councillor Patterson. Um, thanks so very much, Mayor. Um, yes, I would agree with uh, with Councillor Watson and your remarks um, that it would be good to have a public input in, in this uh, and not move forward with it at, at this time. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and through you. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate uh, Councillor Smart bringing this forward. I, I understand philosophically, I agree with. I hate having buildings for vehicles. It, it just compounds the uh, environmental impact of, of the vehicles and then having to have a building that houses them. But I think that it, it will get more discussion um, when we do the infill housing. Um, and and I know that there are there are other instances where depending on the number of bedrooms there were they were having to house more cars within buildings. So um, appreciating this, I I don't feel comfortable making a decision on this um, at this point in time. I'd like to uh, I I do think public consultation is important, and and I would also like to give it some more thought. But I I I understand the you know bringing it forward. I think I've been hearing for many years that we need uh, the parking bylaw redone, and hopefully one of these decades we we will <laughs> we will get to it, I, and hopefully sooner rather than later. And although there have been quite a few of these that have come to us lately, um, I think hopefully if we move to the infill housing 
um, strategy, then that a lot of a lot of that will be eliminated as part of I think uh, our review of that, and um, I, I don't think we've seen as many as we have just this last little while. <laughs> They've been certainly coming, but I do appreciate the spirit in which it's it's brought to council. Thank you. Council, go ahead, Councillor Smart. Back to you. I wonder, is it possible to clarify with staff whether there's anything even scheduled and budgeted for in the next couple of years that would even um, touch upon this item, just for the clarity for, for Council? Mr. Bull, we have an infill housing. We have other things going forward. Uh, is, does any of the things on our timeline for the next couple of years touch on parking and the parking bylaw? Uh, through you, Mayor, um, uh, no specific plans, uh, but um, uh, the infill housing is definitely a worthwhile occasion to look at this because as part of the infill housing program that we plan to create this year, we definitely need to look at what other parking implications are related to uh, adding units to existing properties. Um, definitely the parking facilities bylaw is, is it's, uh, around the same age as the zoning bylaw, which is fairly... Um, significant age by now um, but there's a couple of things in there that are not covered uh, there's no mention of bicycle parking for example or or charging infrastructure all kinds of things that more recently have been added to parking requirements the other thing that usually happens in um, a lot of municipalities is that the parking requirements are, are rolled or combined into the zoning bylaw in this case we're dealing with two different bylaws and um, I think in staff's mind this more substantial look at parking uh, regulation would coincide with the zoning bylaw review but it hasn't been specifically connected the two so um, 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 that, yeah so and I'm hesitating to say well that's maybe the easiest way to do it because the zoning bylaw itself there's depending on how how, how big our review will be, and that's a project that has not been funded yet and not been timed yet. Uh, that in itself has a lot of other complexity, and parking is going to add another complexity to it. So there's also a case to be made, well, maybe maybe that's one of the items related to development that could be dealt with separately on its own. Uh, but yeah, in short, not defined timelines, no earmarked budget just yet. So uh, a quick change, of course, that is can be done quickly, however, um, it, it is a very long-standing uh, requirement that, can, that you can clearly see in the community, in the built environment, older houses, newer houses, all of them have it built at least, or most of them, and um, um, so that's where, this, that's where that is at right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Smart? Councillor Appleton? I looked over, she looked over yeah, I, I guess I'll just comment that I'm I'm concerned that I mean this is one very small piece and I don't want to make the project too large, but I'm concerned that we don't have a review of some of these very small key parking issues as as part of the budgeted and scheduled projects um, coming up. I'll, I'll let Councillor Appleton talk as I sit with that. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. Uh, thank you, Worship, and this and this potentially speaks to uh, some of the movers' uh, intent by the motion. But I'm just wondering whether or not it might be possible to, and I, and I get I get the concerns about scope and scale here. Um, so I'm wondering whether it might be possible to bring forward a friendly amendment to this to restrict it to situations of existing legal nonconformance that might otherwise require a variance. So the 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 as it's currently proposed, this is broadly encompassing all types of residential dwellings, but it may be possible, depending on whether that's the intent of the mover, uh, to limit this to uh, the situations which I think we're discussing procedurally here around the table tonight, is do, do we need to procedurally see all situations of legal existing legal nonconformance come to us, which I think might limit the scope of this a little bit such that it might be more um, it, it might tr trigger less uh, <laughs> concerns about work or overlap with other bylaws that we might subsequently do work on it's up to the mover your worship oh uh, well before we go to that I just want to just turn because I actually don't know that we have legal non-conforming parking 
because uh, legal nonconforming is done when it's done to a, to a code earlier, and I'm not sure we have anything on record that has allowed for less parking in the past that they'd be sitting ex as legal nonconforming, Mr. Mr. Bull. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, looking at the built environment, I, I can see that this has been in place for a very long time. And the other thing I do know is that the ones that have been brought forward to Council recently, those are all situations where it was in place at some point in time, but for different reasons. It was either decommissioned or carport needed to be taken down, scenarios like that. So, yeah, I, but I, I can't confirm with you right now if there may, may be very old examples of nonconformancy, but uh, yeah, thank you. I would just suggest I don't think it's I don't think it would substantively change it because I don't think it'd be it'd catch very much within that net. Councillor Appleton, I'll go back to you. Well, I appreciate that, Your Worship. I'm just I'm I'm trying to deal with this, I, and I, I guess what I'm referring to in that situation exactly as 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 Mr. Bull has described, where there was a conforming situation at one point. In the intervening time, it's become non-conforming in the sense that in general the structure that was mandated is no longer there i guess i'm seeing a situation so therefore it triggers a variance when people are applying for other permits uh, in and around the property it's it's very seldom just somebody driving past and pointing it out i guess i think that this is reasonable to say I, I guess I, and wording is is a little uh, odd here but i guess it's reasonable for us to take this approach to say that for routine situations where this type of non-conformance has come to pass uh, that we would not that you know that that we would not require a variance permit or we would, we would not have this come to council in the sense that I think it's unlikely I won't speak for council but at least for my part I think it's unlikely that we would ask that the variance or the the non-conformance be restored by building a, a, a novel structure essentially what we're saying is we're going to re we're going to reject the variance permit and require that the conforming situation be restored by building the structure I'm not sure whether that's something we would intend to do so I guess I'm just trying to limit the scope of this to a situations where do we have to uh, discuss at council situations where it's not if council in council's opinion it's not reasonable that we would ask that the conforming situation be restored by constructing a building if that makes sense your worship i i get the i understand the intent here I, i'm just i'm not clear on outside of delegating you know approval of variances to staff if it's an this, it is a, it is an illegal nonconformance in all those cases, and so I think you know we'd have to delegate the entirety of the assessment to the staff, and not sort of we can't sort of say it's existing because otherwise people would just knock it down and say it's existing and it's there. So I, I but I'll turn to staff. I, I just I have a hard time with understanding how we could create that nuance. And I, your councilor Apple is absolutely right. The ones that we essentially rubber stamp tend to be long-standing existing. Um, situations where someone's garage is so small it's unusable and we just sort of say yeah it's no problem we recognize that and, and do that we have we have con discussion happening at the staff level <laughs> as to what's possible and I, I might suggest if this motion doesn't pass it might be worth you know it can be maybe brought back as a notice of motion and, and some work can be done with the staff to kind of figure out a model that might you know, provide some of this information and, and address some of the concerns around um, public consultation and so forth. But uh, for the moment, we have sort of a, uh, I'll take it as a question. Is there any mechanism here by which this could be altered to, to address sort of existing non-compliant situations? Mr. Bull? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, and then I'm, I'm giving you some comments on the fly here because I haven't reviewed it in detail, but um, um, one key concern that jumps to mind here in this this particular case and in the in the situation that Councillor Appleton was trying to outline of well maybe the carport was too old and it needed to be taken down and that that's was the the, the origin of the nonconformity so to say uh, if that routinely is kind of um, accepted for what it is it does create a bit of an inequity with new construction because in, for new construction we still require it and uh, so there's some implications there as well so uh, maybe that's an example of of a potential implication that we probably should have a closer look at if council is interested in looking at this more fully and then uh, I think um, we would suggest that if council is interested in that maybe um, give us some direction on, on of uh, 
this is a suggestion on staff's part, give direction to look at this, but maybe it could be combined with uh, another project underway, it could be in housing for example, and then we can have a bit more fulsome evaluation of this, uh, rather than um, on its own, but of course if council wishes to do it just on its own merits, that's that's fine as well, we'll, uh, we'll be able to uh, review it in more detail. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Appleton, you, you should have put this forward. I don't have a sitting as a motion to amend just yet. It hasn't been seconded yet as a motion to amend. Um, but I'll leave it back to you. I think I'm, I, I, uh, I think given what I've heard, Your Worship, I think I'll withdraw it um, just from the basis of um, I, th I think your point is is relatively well made. If it's <laughs> if we don't tighten up the language fairly strongly on that uh, for non-conforming situations, then yes, exactly as you say, somebody could tear their carport down and say, well, it's non-conforming uh, the next day. So there would have to be some work done on staff's be part to determine what the best wording would be in that situation. So I guess the intent, you know, I'm I'm trying to respond to the to the original intent, which I actually agree with, um, but I think. If I understand the intent of it, it's to target, you know, pretty much these routine non-conforming situations that we're not going to mandate get resolved. So, it's a matter of the specific specificity of the language in that case. So we have the main motion in front of us to direct staff to amend the parking bylaw. Um, at this point, is there any other discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Yes, I'd just like to follow up, um, um, uh, Mayor, on the comment from staff that, um, or our own observation, that the in our work on the infill housing may be the next best opportunity to look at this if we need a bit more structured and fulsome analysis, because we will be looking, I am, we're going to be looking at small additions to the number of units and parking in that regard, and um, that might be so that for in terms of you know what's on the agenda and where could we maybe modify a work plan that would seem like a reasonable place for me to do this as the sooner rather than later uh, that waiting for the zoning bylaw uh, re overhaul is too far out and too big of a job uh, to pair it with that in my mind but if we are still on track for doing our infill this year that if we incorporated this idea and I like the direction into that work that I would be I would be comfortable with that thank you go ahead Councillor Smart just hearing the discussion around the table, um, I'm one, I want to propose an amendment to the motion if if this doesn't depart too much from the main in, in intent, but that um, staff um, be directed to prepare a project backgrounder to review the parking bylaw, including removing the requirement, and then to keep the rest. intention to replace the original with this one yes the, the intention would be to modify the motion above with just a clarification of of when the um, next council priority update would be I'm just for my information So I'm going to just make a suggestion, given the timeline that this entails, that I think this would be better dealt with taking away and, and just doing a notice of motion process to bring it and, and think a little bit about is that is a, is a separate project for just this appropriate or maybe a conversation with staff looking at, you know, is there a way of wording this in a way that gives some direction to include the broader parking discussion as part of infill? I'm just, this feels like we're coming up with a solution and a timeline now is quite pushed off that we haven't really defined well. Uh, I, I appreciate this is a motion arising out of tonight. That's that's, that's a, a faster way to get to it. But if we're not 
deciding tonight that I think it might I'm just I'm making a suggestion here, but you, you can it's your motion to, to deal with as you see fit. I, I would like to keep the motion on the table, but I would like to have it say um, uh, to amend the parking uh, to include the removal. Um, just Ms. Williams. Sorry, Your Worship, thank you. I just thought it might be helpful uh, if I could offer some guidance on this. I, I think trying to amend the motion on the floor with something that's that's completely different is probably going to be uh, challenging. might be better to withdraw the motion that's on the floor and put another one on the floor. A second or amendable to, to bring it back, we'll do that. To, to just removing the first motion and to try, that, try this again. Sure, we can remove. Yes, I okay. can withdraw. Mover and seconder are both agreed, so <laughs> that's off. So we're looking at this new one. So you can take away the red, but we can just sort of. Uh, to include the requirement. It's okay. It's <laughs> so perhaps you can read a lot of what you're thinking yeah. of it saying. Yep. Those are smart. Um, that staff be directed to prepare a project at backgrounder for consideration at the next council priority update to amend the parking bylaw to in include, uh, yeah, sorry, I guess, uh, uh, to exclude the requirement to house. That's, I'll put that out there to see if I can get a seconder. Moved and seconded. Question. Yeah. Uh, well, can you take a question before we get to seconding? Thank you. Just, I'm, just before I second, I'm just clar clarity. So this is specifically focused on an ind individual section for amendment of the parking bylaw. So this is what I heard briefly there before sounded more like an overhaul of the parking bylaw with one component specifically mentioned. So I just want to be just be specific that we're talking about the work staff are going to prepare a background on the work required to do this one amendment do I get that right I could expect that the backgrounder may include options to just remove this as opposed to expanding it otherwise but I just want to make sure that at minimum it includes this concept do you feel that's unclear I, your worship if I may I, I just think it would be useful for well <laughs> for the seconders but I'm, I'm interested in seconding but it just but for staff's purposes um, specifically what the the scope of work is for the back or the background is going to include scope of work scope of work would I mean mm -hmm. council is entirely within their purview obviously to direct a, an overhaul full overhaul of the of the parking bylaw and that would you know the backgrounder would come back with a resource estimate of X and then an amendment would come back with an estimate of Y so I'm just getting clarity on exactly the specifics of what options staff are being directed to evaluate as part of the backgrounder Um, hearing the comments around the table, I think it might be valuable to everyone to look to explore a few options um, with the extent of, of scope. Um, do you feel like that needs to be added into the motion? At this point, it's your motion to make, so I'm going to leave it to you to move. If you want to make any changes before I call for her, I'm happy to do so. Didn't like Councillor Smart review the wording that's on the screen right now. It hasn't been seconded yet, so you don't really need the red, but I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, no, that's good. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I guess it should say at the next council priority update, just move the word update up. Yep, 
Um, I'm fine with that wording. Thank you for the help. Yeah, I, I, the reason I'm, I'm passionately going after this tonight is that I, I do feel like this is something that has come up for over a decade. And I've dealt with this on um, commissions and I've dealt with this in the public and I've dealt with this as an architect. And I, I just feel like it's a long time coming that honestly can't wait any longer. And we need to figure out how to fit it in to what we're doing because it does not follow our current council priorities. It does not follow climate action. It does not for follow affordable housing. Um, there are so many issues fundamentally with um, this uh, current bylaw um, and we, we need to look at it. We can't wait any longer. Just for our, everybody's clarification here, the next council priority update is the fall. Is that correct? Or is it later this year? Or later this summer or spring, I should say. Ms. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Yes, it is. I do believe it's towards the end of June. Okay. Second, do you want to add anything? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I, and I share the frustration about the parking bylaw. The parking bylaw is antiquated and doesn't <laughs> represent the current uh, uh, intent of what the district hopes to achieve. So I'm totally in support of that. So I, I, I do support moving forward to look at ways that we can improve it without having to do a wholesale. We've, we've kind of been talking around the idea of doing a wholesale revamp of the parking bylaw, which given everything that building and planning has to do is, is probably impractical in the short term, but I'm always looking for, I'm always supportive of improvements that would, can be done hopefully relatively easy and with a relatively you know low resource expenditure. So uh, yeah, support, uh, appreciate Councillor uh, Smart bringing this forward. Thank you. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say that I, um, and generally support this. I am just I am just concerned about timing, and not uh, concerned that if in some way our infill strategy started to lead us to some parking decisions about in my hope <laughs> less parking all around on on premises that it would interfere with this work in some way that didn't line up well. So it's hard for me to kind of figure that out on the fly, but. Um, um, you know what those those um, conflicts might be, um, but as long as this is really just focused on those existing situations that we we've looked at tonight, I, I would support this. I, it, we we might be having discussions with our community about how much parking the, the parking um, in relation to increasing densification in a in a general way on our on sites around Oak Bay um, before we get to this. So I, or we might get to this first and then have to have the discussion again. So I am a little concerned about timing issues that may arise around these 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 important changes that I hope we see coming with respect to parking. So that's just a comment. Thanks. I'll go to Councillor Braithwaite and Councillor Patterson. Um, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I, again, I, I agree with the, in principle, the, with this um, motion. However, I, I do honestly feel that we need to look at a little bit of um, public input and we need to really consider what's going to be happening with the infill housing strategy. Um, <laughs> And I don't want to duplicate staff's work, so I will sadly have to vote against this this motion. Patterson? Thank you, Mayor. I um, also will not support this motion as it is. I think that there are a few issues for parking that will come up, hopefully, with the infill housing that will be discussed at that time, because I think this is one issue, but then if we... Uh, if we if we change some of the parking requirements, I think we also have to deal with um, parking for electric vehicles, um, which is based on my walking of the district is is becoming a little more problematic. And so I think there there are a, a couple of issues that are going to come up with the housing infill. So I would like to wait and hear what the discussion is at that time. And then I think we can hopefully move to some quick decisions on some of these 
touch point items. Thank you. Smart. My understanding is that we don't have any projects, time, or money set towards discussions with parking. This is not part of our infill housing project. This is not part of any of the work underway. And the only way we're going to be able to tackle this is to give some direction at the council table. Um, so I'm very frustrated to um, to know that we can't even e explore looking at um, even a consideration of looking at parking because this is so important and it's not doesn't seem to currently be in any of our, our work plans and um, um, yeah I don't know if it would be more amenable around the table if if we you know reduce the motion to end at that staff be directed to prepare a project background or for consideration at the next council party update to provide options to amend the parking bylaw period um, perhaps that is more the intent of of what we need, but I think we need to know how, you know, even in the next two years, we're going to be able to have this discussion if we haven't actually included it in any of our projects and scheduling and, and budget. It is not part of our infill housing. Uh, you mentioned modifying the, the motion, but you're not modifying the motion at this point. I, I am. Um, I don't know. Um, would would my seconder um, want to uh, agree to modify the motion or prefers it as it stands? You would have to just make it a, at this point a motion to amend if you wish to. Otherwise, we'll deal with the motion on the floor. I I'm not a big fan of of putting forward motions on the fly and then having a debate, people speaking to the motion, debating the motion, and then if the motion doesn't seem to be getting support, going back and revising it. It's a bit cumbersome as a process. I would again suggest if this is, if trying to come up with wording that you think would have some more clarity, generally that's why we have a notice of motion process is because that provides the ability for staff, myself, others to provide some input into how we might bring forward these motions that are clear. Sometimes just motions are rising, this is one of those. I think if it's not clear enough for you, then modify it if it's, if you're willing to have it stand and we'll move to getting to the point of calling the question. Um, I will make a motion um, to amend it to just the highlighted portions there. I'm now in a position of having a, a, we have a motion arising on a variance for for covered parking and now have a motion arising that is speaking to the broader question of parking at at large without which is not really entirely related to the motion that was or the the issue that was in front of us so I'm just trying to decide here if this is in in order in terms of a motion arising out of the piece So the staff be directed to prepare a project background for consideration of the next council priorities update to provide options to amend the parking bylaw. Yeah, I'll, I'll consider it to be in order. So the motion right now is to amend, to strike the second half of the motion. We're now debating the amendment. I'll speak to it. I'm actually neutral on the amendment. I. I, in a sense, I see the advantage of broadening the discussion. At the same time, if this is the motion, then I would probably prefer to have the consideration of this as part of our infill piece as we're looking at you know, the impact as we look at the impacts of infill and housing and, and parking and so forth. I, I mean, yeah, so I, I'm untorn on this one. <laughs> on a, oh, that's true. We don't. Sorry, my apologies. I'm losing my, my procedural pieces here. So the motion to amend is on the table. Is there a seconder for that amendment? I don't see one, so last chance, no. So we won't, uh, we won't consider the, the motion. To amend, so we're back to the original motion, which is to, as, as laid out on the screen, in black, 
Is there any other discussion on that portion of it? Go ahead, Councilor Watson, before I call the question. Just going back, thank you, Mayor, to uh, your, the Mayor's suggestion that um, there might, if this became a, a motion, um, a notice of motion, and there, there was an opportunity um, between uh, now and when that motion came to us uh, to actually have a discussion about how, uh, as opposed to this this. Um, this particular approach that it actually would be set up to dovetail with our infill housing strategy because I, I do take the point that there's no specific discussion within that uh, project background for infill around parking but I would guess that it inevitably it must arise if we have to uh, make some decisions about where that infill housing is going to go in our neighborhoods and how it will be accommodated so that I, I just put that out there as a as a possibility that might allow us to have a more fulsome discussion around this in a slightly different context than this and I, I would yeah I, that would be something I guess I would encourage uh, thank you Councillor Watson uh, I'm gonna move okay we had a lot of discussion on this but go ahead Councillor Smart go ahead. no I was just going to have a question for staff I anticipated that that you know might possibly one of the options they could bring back under this motion but um so it's just a question for, for staff if this allowed for um, the freedom to come back with something like that. The motion as it stands right now is, is speaking to the one and two family houses, so it's not so much the infill. It's pretty specific to the existing housing stock style, but staff, your read of that motion, again, asking things on the... Mr. Bull. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, I think this background I would focus on this particular topic, and um, it would probably um, outline these different options, either a, a very limited uh, bylaw amendment without um, process, too much process to, to keep it small, or to um, uh, combine it with infill housing, or to, um, let me see. Maybe I'll, I'll, in the background, or I'll reflect and, and point to a, a potential for a bigger update. But yeah, that's kind of my, where my thoughts go right now, if I see this motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So I'll just, I'm going to speak. This is a tough one for me. I understand the goal here. I, I still think this is a bigger question than is being sort of put forward as a motion arising. I, I see the location and type of parking available for all housing types to be an integral part of the design of your community. And some of that is just the architectural rhythm that was mentioned uh, by Mr. Bull, sort of like what is the look and feel of your community? And we, there, we have interesting parking bylaws in the sense that we strongly discourage things like garages facing the street for that reason, so that there's a, there's a more human facing street. Um, there is the longevity of, of the usable space over the, of the lifespan of new buildings. Uh, there's the need, in my mind, to have public input. I think this would substantially change the nature of new builds uh, going into the community, and I think that deserves public consultation and consideration as part of that. Uh, and I think that there is a, uh, uh, I think more broadly, I, I still struggle with the fact that we have allowed for decades now a creeping of uh, people's private property onto the streets and allowed for people to use our streets and if we're also interested in designing our community of having you know more public access to the public street with bike lanes with public spheres with some of those controls is our desire to make sure that we're not having parking on the site so that it creeps onto the street and can we reasonably expect that to do I, I think these are these are community designed questions and while this is a small portion of it I think it fits into a bigger question and I think that bigger question needs to have public input. I think we can have a substantial portion of it within the public, the, the infill housing, if that's if we can find a way to bring that forward as a as a piece. But I just feel this is a substantially bigger question than um, the motion allows for at this point. I think we should have this in the context of the of the community that we want. And I appreciate there's a sense of urgency to this, um, but it's also incredibly important. And some of this, the decisions that we make on this one are going to have a an impact for many decades to come. So I don't think it's something I'm comfortable with, 
treating that lightly, although I do think it's very important, and, and if there's a way we can incorporate that broader discussion into our infill, because uh, frankly, I think a lot of our single family has a potential of becoming infill uh, under the new provincial uh, statements, um, probably an important part of our conversation going forward. Uh, Ms. Williams, you've raised your hand before I call the question, which is, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. I did want to uh, correct uh, a timing that I had provided you earlier. So the next council priority update is at the end of June, but council at the end of November will be considering the term projects that are in play right now and whether or not those will uh, continue to be funded in 2024. So that's actually when the project backgrounder would come back, would be November of 2023. So if, if council is wanting to advance this in time for it to be considered as a part of the infill housing, the scoping for that will be coming forward for council sign off by the end of this quarter. So it might be helpful to roll it into the infill housing strategy um, just for consideration of timeliness. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have a motion on the floor. We have debated it. Is there any other discussion on the on the motion that's in front of us? Um, you can remove the red, I think, at this point, right? Because we have there was no seconder for that. Thanks. Councillor Braithwaite, are you clear on what the motion is now on the floor? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'll call the... Oh, go ahead, Councillor Smart. I just want to clarify, just because the recent comments expanded this to include quite a lot of big issues, and I just want to focus in again on this motion is about whether or not we at the council table think that it's important for us to dictate whether people spend money on housing their cars. That is really what this is about. Um, most people will still build garages, but for the ones who do not want to, do we at council feel that we want to add that other level of unaffordability and constraint um, that's not even being enforced? Thank you, Councillor Smart. Last chance for any other discussion and I'll, before I call the question. I don't see any, so I'll call the question. All those in favor and those opposed, Councillor Patterson, Councillor Watson, Councillor Braithwaite, and, and Mayor Murdoch opposed. Uh, that motion Thank fails. You. I think it probably is worth bringing some contemplation of bringing this conversation back as part of the infill because I think at least the broader question of parking is, is probably worth at least laying out some of those those larger guidelines as part of that, but I think that should better be done with a notice of motion than a, a motion arising. Thank you. Um, any other new business <laughs> before I get to the uh, motion to close the meeting? Nope. All right, so can I get someone to read in the reasons for closing the meeting? Your Worship, I would move uh, that uh, Council close the meeting uh, to the public pursuant to sections 91C and L of the Community Charter. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Thank you. We've been seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, are we leaving here and going into how do we turn off the uh, streaming and everything else? Yep. So everybody can just stay in this meeting for that uh, for a moment, and we'll turn off the other pieces of the 